Okay, I'm going to gavel our school committee to order on uh, May 30th, 2019. Um, we have, we want to make sure we start our agenda on time with the teacher recognition. Appreciate everybody being here tonight, and uh, we'll get started. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Doherty. Thank you. Um, we have two events each year where we honor our teachers here at school committee meetings and our staff. One is at the beginning of the school year when we recognize all of our new teachers that come into the, the district. And then this event, um, which we started a few years ago, is when we recognize staff for significant milestones in their career. Um, so this evening you're going to hear staff members that are receiving their 10-year pin, their 20-year pin, 30-year uh, pin, 35-year pin. Uh, we are also going to honor those that are retiring this evening, oh, at the end of the school year, and also who are receiving professional teacher status where they have completed three successful years in the Reading Public Schools as a, as a teacher. So um, we're going to do this by school uh, and other, other departments. So we're going to start first with Reading Memorial High School um, in Cape Boynton. Uh, Kate is on first tonight because, uh, first of all, she's one of our newest principals, but also because the high school have their baccalaureate this evening, and she's going to be going there after this. So, Kate, if you'd like to go over to the podium. And, and what we're going to ask is when uh, Kate calls your name, if you can just come up to the podium and get the, uh, the pin or the apple or the certificate. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. The first person I would like to recognize, first of all, actually, let me back up a little bit and just say that I'm really thrilled to be here. I work with an amazing, amazing, amazing faculty, and I could not be happier or prouder to be in my role, and I can pretty much at this point say that I am no longer new. Um, so it is my real distinct pleasure to be here um, to recognize a number of my faculty who have reached these milestones. Uh, so the first person I would love to call up is Ms. Emmeline Festa in our foreign language department for her 10-year wow. milestone. Yeah. Thank you. The next person I would like to call up is Mr. David Blanchard from our social studies department for his 20-year milestone. The next person I would like to call up is Mr. Joseph Mulligan, also for his 20-year milestone. Wow. I think Mr. Mulligan oh. is likely practicing for uh, the performance during yes. uh, graduation, which is Sunday. So I will hold this off for Joe. Uh, the next person I would like to call up is Ms. Martha Moore for not only her 35-year milestone, but Martha is also retiring this year wow. after 35 years. I've got two things for you. Martha, congratulations. Thank you. We'll do the retirees all together. So I have two. Okay, three retirees. Yeah. <laughs> Next up, I have uh, three teachers who have earned their professional teacher status this year. So it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce to you uh, Mr. Patrick Daly from our Social Studies Department. Next up, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Timothy McIntyre uh, from our science department. And finally, for our last professional teacher status, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Beatrice Murphy from our foreign language department. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've got three retirees. Um, Martha is here. Um, next person I would like to honor is Ms. Joanne Gregorowitz from our guidance department. Yep. 
I think they're going to do a picture. And then the last person I would like to introduce and honor is Ms. Kristen Killian from our um, Fine and Performing Arts Department. We'll hold that aside for our Ready? Where would you like us? Away from the podium, I imagine. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Boynton. Now I'm going to have the principal of the Barrows Elementary School, Beth Levitt, please come up. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm equally excited, just like Kate said, of being a new principal this year. It's been an awesome year. I cannot believe we're coming to a close in a couple of weeks. There's just, it's been great, so thank you very much for that. Um, Laura Payak is the first person being recognized for 10 years. She was unable to make it tonight, but We'd like to recognize Laura. And now we have Lori Hill. Come on up. Oh, you're right in front of me. 20 years. <laughs> and for 30 years, um, Roberta, I'm going to say Mrs. G. That's what she's known in the school. So Mrs. G, come on up for 30 years. I do have one teacher who's getting professional status tonight. She's our reading specialist, Patricia Flaherty. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. I'm going to now have Julia Hendricks, principal of the Birch Meadow Elementary School, present her awards. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having us here tonight. I have a few staff members who are not here but are being recognized for years of service. For 10 years of service, Jennifer Kabrinsky and Rebecca Schramm. And for 20 years of service, Brenda Gilday and Heidi Murray. Then we have um, a whole bunch of people getting professional status, which is very exciting. And I'm going to call forward the people who are here. Catherine Breen. Peggy Costello. <laughs> Paula Falvey. <laughs> Melissa Healy. <laughs> Beth McCarran. Tammy Merzicki. And there are two educators who could not be with us this evening who achieved professional status, Olivia Romano and Heather Sullivan. And finally, we have one retirement at Birch Meadows School, our reading literacy specialist, Deb Quietak, who actually left us in December, but is coming back tonight to be honored. We miss her terribly. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Now I'm going to have Lisa Maria Polito, the principal of the Joshua Eaton Elementary School, come and present her awards. Good evening, everybody. Fabulous night tonight. Um, Joshua Eaton would like to recognize um, two of our staff members who have dedicated 20 years of service to Reading Public Schools. Um, unable to be with us tonight is Kathy Carmody, 20 years of service. So congratulations to Kathy. And with us tonight, um, one of the best paras in town, Janet McElhaney. <laughs>
We would also like a, to recognize uh, Marie Kiley for 30 years of service. Uh, she was unable to make it this evening. But congratulations to Marie. And then um, for me, it feels like a privilege to be able to award professional status to Miss Kelly McQuillan. Thank you, Lisa Marie. I'd like to have Sarah Levesque, the principal of the Killam Elementary School, now come and present her awards. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us. Well, it is my honor to um, introduce some of our staff members who are reaching their milestones this evening. Um, unable to be with us tonight, but um, here in spirit is Kate Gustafson, who is celebrating 10 years. Um, with our school district. We'd also like to recognize Allison Matthews, who is our reading specialist. Uh, she's celebrating 20 years in our school district. And finally, celebrating 35 years in our school district is our speech and language pathologist, Kathy McMillan. So congratulations to the three of them. I'd like to recognize um, a couple of individuals who have made professional status this year. So I'd like to invite up Victoria Binns, our current kindergarten teacher, for reaching professional status. Uh, I'd also like to ask Sharon Grokow, a school nurse, to come up. Oh, wow. Sharon has also achieved professional status. Unable to be with us tonight, um, but also receiving professional status is Marissa Bada, our social worker in our therapeutic support program, as well as Kathleen Splain, our teacher in our therapeutic support program. So congratulations to them. And if I could ask Flori Johnson to come up. Lori is our district psychologist, and uh, we are lucky to have her in our building each and every day. So, Flori, congratulations on your Thank professional you. status. Thank you, Sue. Finally, I'd like to ask Karen McCary to join me up here. Uh -huh. This is a bittersweet one for me. So, Karen is joining me as a retiree at the end of this year. Um, she is celebrating 28 years of service here in Reading. And um, if anyone knows Karen, you know that she's the heart and soul of not only our second grade team, um, but certainly our building and um, my personal cheerleader. So, I appreciate her very much. And we are sad to see you go, but so excited by what's ahead for you. So, congratulations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. I'd like to have uh, Ricky Shanklin, the principal of Parker Middle School, come forward and present her awards. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to recognize and, and reward our um, fabulous, dedicated staff of Parker Middle School. So I have a couple of teachers who could, couldn't be here tonight. So Eric Goldstein. He has been a sixth grade social studies teacher for 10 years, so he's met the 10 year milestone. Um, Lori Ward, who has been a dedicated paraprofessional for us for 10 years, she's unable to be here tonight. And Jane Costa, who is a seventh grade social studies teacher, and she's unable to be with, her, with us tonight, but she um, has dedicated the last 20 years to Parker Middle School. And the people who are here tonight, um, I'm very excited to acknowledge them and their service, um, three of which, three of whom I um, hired myself three years ago, my first year. So very excited to recognize them. So Andrew Norton um, can come up. He has dedicated 20 years of service to Parker Middle School. <laughs> there is nobody at Parker who does what Andrew does with a lot of musicians every single day, so thank you. Um, we have three people who are teachers who are here with um, professional status. 
Amy Betancourt is a seventh and eighth grade special education teacher. If you could come up, please. <laughs> Jennifer Blackman is a sixth grade math teacher. Please come up. <clears throat> and Ariana Seligman, who is our physical education teacher. Thank you, Ricky. I'd like to have Joanne King, the principal of the Woodhead Elementary School now, come forward and present her awards. Thank you for having us. I have no voice, so we'll do the best we can with what we have. Um, I'd like to introduce Mia Gaska for her 10-year milestone. She is currently a fourth grade teacher at Wood End. I wouldn't tell any stories about her. <laughs> um, next, I'd like to introduce Ainsley Harrington, one of our amazing special education teachers in our Crossroads program. This is Ainsley's 10th year of service for Reading Public Schools. <laughs> They're all going to be sick tomorrow. Um, <laughs> not here is Janet Williams who is celebrating 20 years. She's a special education paraprofessional in our building, and she is truly amazing. What a gift to our students. But she wasn't able to be here. Um, also, um, getting professional teaching status recognition, Maggie Cullen, who's not able to be with us tonight. Um, she is a, the special educator in our Compass program and truly gifted. Another teacher who is getting professional teaching status tonight is Stacy Forsman, who is our grade one teacher extraordinaire. <laughs> and certainly, last but not least, recognizing um, Marion Nyan for her service in the Reading Public Schools. She'll be retiring this year to enjoy her family. So, congratulations, Marion. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. I'd like to have Kelly Boswick now from the Rise Preschool come forward and present her awards. Good evening. Um, I would like to uh, recognize Cara Connolly. She um, is a parent in our sub separate classroom for 10 years of service. She's not here tonight. And then I would also like to recognize uh, Maria Fis. Fitzpatrick. She's a PT not only for RISE but for the whole district and she could not be here tonight. And then um, the last person I'd like to um, recognize for their milestone is Alicia Radard. She um, has served 20 years of service and she works also for the district uh, and she could not be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you Kelly. I'd like to now have our Chief Financial Officer Gail Dowd present an award. Can I move the table again? <laughs> have to talk to those facilities people who set that up, huh? So I want to thank you for also allowing us to recognize um, the folks who keep sort of the lights going every day. So I have the honor of recognizing Paula Santarpio, who works with me in central office, and I cannot imagine the office without Paula. She literally keeps all of us, as Chris is nodding over there, on the straight and narrow and make sure all the ordering and invoicing and receipts and everything happens. So she is definitely key to our staff. So for 20 years. Thank you, Gail. I just want to recognize a couple of other staff that could not be here uh, this evening. 
uh, from Coolidge Middle School, Jessica Losey and Pauline Sutsis. And Francine Rubano Jones. And from our food service department, Mary Neal and Carlene Samen. So I want to uh, congratulate them also on their years of service. That's it. Thank you. I just want to really say a thank you on behalf of the committee to I didn't um, some, I didn't add up all the years as we were going along. It wasn't quite fast enough, but uh, definitely appreciate um, because what you do here is for our students and um, as we approach this weekend you know graduation which is you know the culmination of their careers here with us and so many of you have touched each one of their lives in many different ways you don't always get to know it today um, but uh, hopefully in years future you hear from students and 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 see how well they're doing and um, a good part of that is because of the experience they have here in Reading and the teachers that touch their lives. So we really want to appreciate all that you do for our district um, and especially a special thank you to those that are retiring. So thank you very much. We'll take just a couple minute break and um, before we go into pub, we have, we'll start our regular meeting with the public input and resume our standard agenda, but I want to thank you all. So just take a couple minutes break.
resume us in order. Um, I know our, our in-room mics aren't working, but I want to get us going again. So I'm going to start out just by, uh, we started with the recognition. The mission of our public schools, where's Linda? Maybe to use my coach voice, Elaine. Yeah. Use your voice. Oh, Linda's here. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Sorry, we we have to start our meeting. Sorry, I'm not. <laughs> so, mission of the public schools, just to remind ourselves, and as we had a room full of teachers who are the the life of executing that mission, is to ensure that our students have common and challenging, meaningful learning experiences in academics, health and wellness, the arts, community service co-curricular activities in athletics, and I think we had a sampling of teachers from all over, all over that spectrum. We will lead and manage our school community to reflect the values and culture of the Reading community and guide and support our students to develop an appro the appropriate skills, strategies, creativity, and knowledge necessary to be productive, informed, independent citizens in our global society. So with that, we're gonna start on the regular agenda, which starts with public comment. And I know we have two people here tonight. We have Deputy Chief Clark and Mr. Brown. So I'm going to have Deputy Chief. Can I go first, sir? You're going to go first? Thank you. Okay. Good All right. Good decision, <laughs> Bill. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, appreciate the time here. Um, I just wanted to update the school committee on some collaboration that the schools and the police department have done, have been ongoing. And um, I just want to thank Dr. Doherty for his support during all this. It's been great work with him. We meet on a regular basis. We have uh, some great conversations. He's been very supportive of our involvement in the schools. And for those of you who don't know, that don't follow us on Facebook or social media, one of the things we have been doing, we have one more elementary school left. It's a surprise. I'm not going to say when it is, but Birch Meadows <laughs> is the last school left. Tomorrow. But we have been having uniformed officers going into the schools and serving lunch. Full get up. Hair nets, rubber gloves, aprons, <laughs> the full thing. Uh, we get a safety lesson from the uh, lunch ladies telling us how to do our job and not mess up their line. Um, but it's been perceived extremely well with all the schools, with the teachers. We get behind the counter, the kids don't know we're coming. They walk in, they see all these uniformed police officers back there, the school resource officers, our community service officer, our traffic and safety officer, myself, members of my command staff, the detectives, and then the police officers that have children in that school have been coming as well that day. And we serve the kids lunch, and after we're done serving lunch, we sit down at the table with them and chat, chit chat with them. We get some great questions. The most common thing um, I always hear is, oh, can you handcuff us? Can you handcuff us? And we have been giving into those. Uh, no, we haven't, Dr. Doherty, but we have been giving into those. Um, uh, but it's been a great collaboration. The kids have loved it. We've gotten a ton of positive feedback on it. Um, it's something we hope to continue in the future. And a project that was. Um, I had really wanted to do it for a long time now. Um, Dr. Doherty approached him about it all over. Absolutely, this is a great idea, was redoing the public interview room. For those who don't know, the public interview room is located off the lobby of the police station. And it's where people, it's not where we say we interview the bad guys. We do that in a different room. Uh, this is the room where if the public comes in with some concerns, something's happened. It's, usually when you're coming in the police station, it's not under good circumstances. The room before was a red tile floor plain white walls, hard plastic chair, plain table. Not overly inviting. So I had a vision to make that room more comforting, more inviting, more friendly, put artwork on. So not only did the local businesses step up, Jordan's Furniture, for example, donated a couch, Village Carpet donated the rug, uh, the paint store with the purple door donated the paint and supplies, White Land Books donated a bunch of books, Scott Magoon is a local illustrator, is gonna be doing a personal painting for us there. Um, Staples donated uh, chalk and supplies because we did paint one of the walls with chalkboard paint. And I approached Dr. Doherty, who uh, put me in touch with uh, Principal Boynton from the high school. She recommended two art students, Megan Corum and Jahan V. Patel, both took on their own. I, they met me at the station, explained what I was looking for, some friendly murals, some police with children, police with adults, just very friendly, warming murals. They came to me with a bunch of sketches. I said, great, let's go ahead and move with it. I had a vision for how I wanted the room to look. They came in on Saturdays, Sundays, after school, April vacation, on their own time. And let me tell you, I had a vision of how I wanted the room to look. They greatly exceeded uh, my expectations. 
The room, if you haven't seen it, please come by the police station and take a look. It came out unbelievably well. And it's been used on a regular basis now. We've been having people in there with kids. The kids can now sit on the rug instead of a hard floor, play with Legos, read books, draw in the uh, chalkboard paint. And we're getting a lot of comments on how friendly. You know, granted, nothing, if you're having a bad day, can change that. But at least if it's more inviting, more warming, that's kind of what we want to do. And um, it would not have been possible without, again, the collaboration with the schools. And I just felt that the school committee should know this and I continue to work with the schools. And I just, if it wasn't for Dr. Doherty and his support, this never would have happened. And I just wanted to thank him and recommendation and Kate Pointing and those two students that really took their time out of the way and did a fantastic job. Right. And I just really wanted you to know that. Yeah, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Appreciate uh, Deputy Chief Clark coming tonight. Um, so thank you. I have to share with the whole committee and hear it from you, which is different from it being repeated um, by by me from a, a as a report. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. And like I said, I just that's, couldn't wouldn't have been possible without the students, principal, and Dr. Doherty. So right. it's like we're glad with our continued collaboration with the schools and all the businesses in town. Great. Thank you. Very thank much. you. All right. Excellent. Thank you. And Mr. Brown. <laughs> How are you? I'm well, thank you. Able to get up and take nourishment. Didn't read name in the obituaries this morning, so that's always a good stat. Okay. <laughs> in 1946, there was a committee formed to find a suitable memorial for those that made the supreme sacrifice in World War II. Well, fast forward to 1957, uh, North Reading decided to build their own high school, and as you know, Reading Memorial High School became Reading Memorial High School to honor those that had made the sacrifice. Uh, both in World War II and in Korea. In the lobby coming in tonight, there are several plaques, and I'm here to ask the school committee, within your $46 million budget, if you could find a couple hundred dollars to put the five service flags above them. I think it would be great. To put actual flags, you're saying to put flags above yep. the uh, glass? Um, if, yeah. if, if you come in, the only flag I ever see is the one beside the principal's office. American flag, and I think our veterans deserve more than that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I'd like to suggest, I know uh, it's not within your purview, perhaps get more involved in Veterans Day. Uh, the veterans would love to come into the school and talk to the kids on Veterans Day. The only one left, I think, is that Josh Wheaton mm -hmm. still holds a Veterans Day services. Uh, Packard did, they, they've gone by, put in did, they've gone by. I think there'd be a great combination there. So if, if you can find it within your budget, I, I would appreciate it. I'm sure all the veterans would. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thanks very much for coming, coming out. Vote? Yes or no? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Um, we have our consent agenda. And so we'll do the consent agenda. We'll move into yeah. reports. And then we have our quarterly personnel update our financial report, and then we have the first reading of two policies. Um, so we'll step through it. So the, can you read the motion for the we'll move. Yep. Yeah. I'd Mark. like to request that we pull out the London trip from the consent agenda. Is there are questions about that that I'd like to discuss before we just approve it? Um, okay, so we, your suggestion is to pull it out right now and then discuss it with the intent of getting the questions answered. And or we can just discuss it before we do it, yeah. whatever the right means of action right. is. Right, why don't we, I think we can just discuss the, um, no, I think for the consent agenda we need to pull that out. Right, that's what so I thought too, so. A motion to <coughs> remove motion to pull the, pull the London, London trip. trip out of the consent agenda. Okay, Second. uh, seconded all in favor. So that's pulled out of the agenda right now. So now you can read the motion to approve the consent agenda without the London trip. Okay. Move to approve the consent agenda without the London uh, letter of, no, sorry, the um, approving the London trip. Second. And all those in favor? And the motion carries 6-0. Okay, Mr. Wise, would you, can you uh, address the questions to the, on the London trip? Um, sure, yeah. So. Obviously, I'm one of the, the new guys here, but I was reading through our policies with regards to this as well. Um, and in particular, it's policy going all the way back up again, um, IJOA. And this, this request is well, well ahead. You know, we're talking about a year and a half ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe even two years almost at this point, right? So it's, it's well ahead, which means that it can't 
comply with all the documentation being requested. If you look at the policy in mm -hmm. particular, the policy says it has to provide basically a sample contract, which isn't here in any way, shape, or form. Um, it does allow for, you know, a subsequent approval at a later mm -hmm. point in time, um, but I have never seen, and I've been following school committee for quite some time, and maybe, you know, one of you that's been here for a while, I've never seen a, a secondary approval come back um, for something that's so far out with the contract and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, so I guess the question is, this is 2021, the documentation says the current 9th and 10th graders, which will be 11th and 12th graders in that period of time. Right. Um, but can we possibly approve it considering it's not in alignment with the policy that we have and or is there an expectation that if we preliminarily approve it, we will get it coming back to us with enough information that aligns to the policy? Dr. Darty. So we normally do approve these a couple years in advance. You'll notice a lot of the international field trips the reason for that is so that students can join a payment plan um, and start paying towards it because the this one is $3,000. Um, I do a final approval. I've, I've already met with Mr. Dentremont, and I meet with every overnight or international uh, field trip, out-of-state field trip. Um, they, they give me additional information as we get closer. So there is a contract with Explorica uh, already. There is. That ex oh, yeah. Yes. That's how they came up with this, uh, the price structure, and yeah. Okay. So should, as a point of note then, should the contract, as basically the, the one that we have for Parker, is more or less an outline of a contract as well, should such a contract be included in the packet on a go-forward basis if we have one, and or should we make sure that we document or update our policy to say that the secondary or post-approval is, is conducted by the superintendent? Mm -hmm. Instead of the this preliminary committee. approval of the school committee. Mm -hmm. Either one or both is really okay. It's really more of a, po a procedure slash policy question than it is any objection to the trip necessarily. It just right. seems like from the policy, technically we can't approve it. Right. The policy is written. So the, right, one of two things, either the, the Explorica contract could come to us and that would be compliant with the policy or as the, um, Mr. Oh, Wise is, is saying, we could look at um, updating our policy to indicate that, you know, that, that there's a secondary approval by the, or review and approval by the superintendent that includes those details. So we'd have to update our policy. So, something like that. I mean, there's other things that the policy says it's asking for that we don't have here, right? Percentage of eligible students, and that's going to change between now and then because the student numbers change. Right. So it's hard to say that, okay, let's say there's 500 kids between 11th and 12th grade, then mm -hmm. 26 are going, so we're talking about 5% of the kids overall, um, give or take. But... Um, so it's just other things that seem like the policy says should be delivered, and especially in the case of international travel, we, I think we should be a little bit more diligent about it. Not that we should not not approve it, but just put another finer tooth comb on it, I guess is the, mm -hmm. the way I'm trying to present it. So I, I think um, review, look, taking a look at the policy is going to be an um, appropriate thing for the committee to do sometime in the next couple of months, um, you know, maybe over the summer. But cu so currently right now, um, are you satisfied with the Dr. Darty indicating that he's reviewing the policy or I mean the contract or would you like the contract you know or we can have the contract come and we can move and approve this at the next meeting we can look at this at the next meeting. the problem with waiting till the next meeting is that the students will already be out of school oh this because it's our meeting is the um, and the whole idea is that they were going to start advertising this after school committee approval so, Mr. Wise, are you comfortable with the superintendent will pro can provide us with the Explorica contract in the as part of the packet, Dr. Darty? I can, I can certainly do that. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I'm just one person. So that that hasn't yeah. been a standard practice with the committee. We've always done the form. Right. Um, and I, I don't have the policy in front of me, and but I'm. So I don't want, no, that's okay. I, yeah, so I, no, what I'm saying is that that has always been the process. So yeah, we've used the form. So I think yeah, we so need I, to true up the process and the policy. And, um, but for yeah. right now, you would be just satisfied that, doc, that Dr. Darty can show the contract. To, to, that, to that point about the policy, we are going to be, before this even happened tonight, we are reviewing this yeah. policy this summer. Ms. Boynton and I have already had several conversations about field trips, international field trips. So we're going to be looking at this policy this summer. 
Mm -hmm. Mr. Robinson. I, I would, I guess when we have that, con I don't want to see all that stuff. I would rather <coughs> approve the trip in, in, in conceptual and then delegate making sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed to, to a staff member, right? Isn't that? Yeah. Keep the administrative. Right. Yeah. I'm perfectly right. okay with that yeah. from a process perspective, but right. the policy, policy is the policy right. as it is. Not so. Aligned. Um, so again, I, I'm just one person. I, uh, I'm okay with that as long as we adhere to, as long as we say okay. And if, if it's there's nothing at risk by including that temporary contract or preliminary contract in the in the follow up mean, yeah. minutes, yeah. I'm okay with that personally. But I don't know about the rest of the committee as as their their intents are. Okay, so. Um, if I can sort of summarize, Will, the motion would be to approve the London trip with the um, contract details to be included in the school committee minutes. Um, I would say, let me just augment that slightly. Yep. <coughs> um, it looks, it appears as though it's over April vacation, so there's no other educational alternative that's necessary as well, but maybe we should also update it to say not applicable over April vacation. And I'll, technically we haven't set the schedule for that year. But it appears what he's targeting. Yes, it know. is. A, yes, it's April vacation. Right. Yes. So the other, the other thing that's in here that it says it needs to do is provide educational alternative information, which the Parker one does, and a few others do. Um, so maybe just make that clear. Not applicable. Because oh, of the April educational vacation. alternative is not applicable to this field trip because it's over a vacation Education. period. Yep, exactly. Okay. Again, that's a piece of the policy that you're saying. Yes. And exactly. it might not be reflected in the form. So I just, I guess, maybe to amend that slightly is yeah. to say. Uh, approve with the caveat that a couple that these are a, a couple additional things estimated number of students uh, alternative education and or not necessary and then the contract are added as part of the supplementary materials after the meeting after the meeting okay so everybody's on the same page friendly amendment that's the motion dr. Dardy are you I'm fine with that I'll okay. I'll try to I, I will put it in the, the June yeah. 20th packet yeah okay so or information right so that you have it any um, second? We need a second. 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 Thank you, Ms. Borowski. And all those in favor? And it's 6 0. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price. Um, all right. So, oh, reports. Reports. I'm going to start with Mr. Parks. Well, we actually have point, something. Point of information. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> I think we voted to take it out of the consent agenda, but I don't think we voted to approve the consent agenda yet. Do we have to? Um, I think we did. Yeah, we we, voted, did, we, did. did we? we approved we it. Did. Okay. Yeah. Six, Sorry. Oh. <coughs> Linda? Yeah. yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Because there were like two yeah. votes, three votes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, Mr. Parks. Thank you. Um, both Linda and I had a chance to go to uh, the vaping awareness given by Jason Lewis last month. Um, between the, the, board of health, the State Board of Health, the AG's office, they're declaring it an epidemic. And they're trying to push that through the State Senate at this point. Um, knowing the health risks as far as aneurysms, cancer, and pure nicotine addiction, this is something they're pushing very hard on at this point. It's also something we as a committee need to be aware of because as a parent, I know what's happening in, in our youth and we need to take action on it. And we have our cross set to do that, thankfully. Um, I found a, a myriad of information as far as one little vape is equal to a pack of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. I would have never thought that because they sell it as an alternative to quit. Um, it makes it more addictive than it does anything to quit. Right. It's sort of a falsehood. We also had just um, at Parent University, Erica McNamara did two did sessions on specifically focused on the vaping, and it was you know very informative, very well received. So I think it just points out that we need to keep um, looking for those opportunities um, for the Parent University and Rakasa. So appreciate it, um, Dr. Oxen. And just to add to that, Rakasa actually, um, Erica McNamara and our SROs have been presenting in the middle schools about the dangers of educating the kids about the dangers of vaping, mm -hmm. which is, um, was, I will, I will second how frightening that um, the reality of this vaping crisis is, and it is a crisis. Yeah, it's one in five students right now are vaping. 
starting at the fourth grade. Yeah. Wow. They just don't know, yeah. some of them. Mr. Robinson. So what was the, was there a, uh, with the presentation, was there a to-do list or something that came out the, of it? And what it, level of, of responsibility falls at home? Okay, this, this, the parents need to, I mean, this, we can't put everything on Rick Arcasa and the schools. The parents have to get involved. Too. Absolutely, agree 100%. This was more informational. Um, there were some takeaways that you could go with. Um, there were, I want to say, six or seven school districts represented there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was, it and was beyond, truly. select. Yeah, select board, boards, yeah. boards of health. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was a great program. You know, what the state is doing as far as all the flavors, they're, they're already trying to pass legislation to ban them. Yeah. So they're taking steps there. Absolutely, steps have to be taken at home to make pe uh, children aware. We need to keep doing it in school level as well. Dr. Doxa. The, there, thank you so much. There were also resources that they were offering in terms of educating parents about the dangers because there are lots of, uh, there's lots of misinformation out there. And one of the challenges they're facing is the very powerful uh, publicity engine that's putting them the in the publicity for Juul and the other vaping um, companies out there, but it's very hard to fight that. Um, and so they're looking for collaborations with the schools, with the town, with the recreation departments, with whomever they can get. And the Attorney General's office offers presentations as part of what they do. I believe it's for free to come to speak and they're talking about collaboration also with athletic organizations and how important it is. Um, one of the points they stressed was how important it is not just to focus on discipline because these kids are getting hooked before they even realize what the impact is. So to give them the support like our athletic policy requires, mm -hmm. our students get support, not just discipline if they do drugs or something. This is a drug that's not yet been declared that way. It's, a, it's illegal for kids that young. But we need to give them support when they get hooked. The pediatricians don't even know how to deal with this well yet. So just disciplining kids who have an addiction isn't the answer. And so it's at the point of trying to figure out what is the answer and how we can all collaborate on finding, figuring that out. But they stressed it wasn't just discipline. Expelling kids, suspending kids is not. It's gonna fix it. It's well, not gonna fix it. To Mr. Robinson's point is that the approach at home also has to be both discipline and sort of recovery and replacement activities. So that's up to the, the parents need sort of the same approach. So it's, um, you know, multi-pronged. But thank you very much for attending it. Um, Mrs. Borowski, Hi, some hi. of us don't have our 375 buttons on and we're all very sorry. Uh, no, no worries at all. Um, so I have a very quick CPAC update. It's, it's extremely brief because the May CPAC meeting was canceled. So I don't have a CPAC update, but the next CPAC meeting and the last one I believe of the year will be Tuesday, June 11th at seven o'clock. So um, mark your calendars and make sure you come out for that meeting. And for Reading 375, you all know it kicks off tomorrow night. So much planning for over a year to get to this place. I'm delighted to announce that it is going to be 70 degrees and sunny. Yay. Perfect Yay. day uh, to be out on the comet. It starts just prior to 7 p.m. There's going to be a Jumbotron live music, a couple surprises we're not telling anybody about, so you have to come to find out. Um, and we have more than 20 venues downtown, restaurants, local businesses, churches, and organizations are hosting just a huge variety of events. The details are all on uh, writing375.com. So you can see what venues are participating and what is all happening. But it's going to be a great night tomorrow night. Beautiful weather. Definitely come to the Common if you're around. And the next day is mm -hmm. the concert for Reading right here at the Reading Memorial High School Performing Arts Center. It's produced by William Enslow. It features the Reading Symphony Orchestra, the Reading Community Singers. And I'm both delighted and sorry to tell you that tickets have gone briskly. We do not have many tickets left. Um, yeah, uh -huh. the response has been amazing. Um, so this is a free concert. There's no cost for a ticket, but to manage 
crowd, we need, you need the ticket to gain entry. We are reserving a few, so if you're absolutely desperate to come, I do encourage you to come out a little bit before 3 o'clock on Saturday, and there will be some tickets, not many, but some available at the door for some for surf. It's going to be a beautiful concert. Um, all of the events over the two-week period are at Reading375.com. That's where everyone can go. Um, and I would like to acknowledge, I, I'm sorry that the town manager and deputy chief are no longer here. We've enjoyed tremendous support from them, both from a PR perspective, getting the word out into the community, but also a logistic perspective. Um, they've just really partnered with us to try to make this all work for the community. Um, and I certainly want to thank Dr. Doherty and his staff, who've also been helping through social media and email to educate the parents of the community um, you know, for a lot of families, to get to see a live symphony is really something, and to get to do it for free is really something. So I think a lot of these event, um, vintage baseball, um, the symphony concert, um, the event downtown, there's Porch Fest, Porch Fest um, free music, the art show, the townwide art show with more than 40 original works of art at more than 12 venues around the community. There's a lot of stuff that parents would want their kids to participate in. So I really do appreciate the school department helping us educate the parents so that they can bring their kids out, um, their students out, and enjoy all of this. Um, and the support of the schools includes a brand new celebration of Reading 375. I think this might be the first big public announcement of it. Um, but Dr. Doherty worked with the principals in the district to see if they could come up with a way that the students across the Reading Public Schools could participate in Charter Day, which is June 10th, mm -hmm. um, Monday. This is the literal birthday of Reading. And if you'll indulge me, in case you didn't know, on May 29, 1644, the upper house of the Bass Bay Colony Legislature voted that Lynn Village, at the request of the inhabitants thereof, shall be called Reading. A couple of weeks later, on June 10th, the lower house concurred, making it official. So June 10th is the actual birthday of our town. Um, so principals have been um, asking all of the students in the district to wear purple in honor of Reading 375 on Monday. And I sent that blurb to the principals, and I'm hoping that through <coughs> newsletters and morning announcements, they can share that little bit of town history with our students. So okay. really grateful for that support, and really excited that the students are going to be participating. And what is this historic event in our town? Thank you. I wonder if there will be um, children who will be begging to dye their hair that color for that <laughs> day. <laughs> so on opening night. <laughs> that would be fun. On opening night, we have a local salon, Main 565, that is going to have a tent on the common, and they're actually providing purple hair extensions and purple oh. hair talking. So you, that's oh, actually okay. happening. <laughs> Friday night? All right, now I'm there. <laughs> I guess I'll be doing the purple hair thing. Uh, okay. Right there with you. No, All right. You. Well, excellent. It is very exciting. Gail could do purple hair. Dr. Dari, that would be a problem for you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Docs, are there any reports? No, nope, Rakasa was canceled this week. I'm looking forward to next time, next yep. meeting to give a report. Great. And um, ATRAC uh, did meet. Uh, we hadn't met in two months, but met last week. And um, one of the focuses is um, basically a acknowledgement or a celebration of um, June is Pride Month and trying to go ahead and do something on the town common on the sign. And Heather's really still working on that. And then there was a lot of discussion about trying to collaborate with uh, the library or the clergy association to do something this summer along the line, later this summer along the lines of sort of a family picnic, picnic um, on Memorial Park perhaps. So just trying to get that sort of gathering of people, some, some you know, maybe build in a theme of um, sort of your ethnic cooking and sort of bring that to your picnic. So we're, we're working on that, trying to find something over the summer, which is really difficult because uh, New Englanders go away for the weekends. So probably be a weeknight. And I think that was it. I don't think I have any other reports. Mr. Robinson? So yeah, I have a rec committee report. We met last Tuesday and we went through a bunch of uh, uh, amplified sound permits and for the different events during the summer but the big uh, topic of the meeting was uh, the Birch Meadow tennis court upgrades uh, and we didn't hear the presentation from uh, Kate Kate was not there Kate Kaminer uh, but uh, Jen kind of filled us in and it's another one of these projects that you know I love when uh, it's a big in-kind uh, donation uh, from the tennis friends of Reading Tennis. They're committed to raise 
ten thousand uh, dollars and for the project which is seventeen thousand dollars it's going to fix the cracks and, and stuff in the and I don't know if anybody knows but those court or sees that but those courts are getting non-stop use all the time yeah. down there and I, I don't know how late they keep the lights on ten. until 10 o'clock Ten o'clock uh, so you know just really you know it's nice the same thing we I mentioned uh, a few months or when you were still on the committee when the softball group came up with their own money to, to do the field you know that's a that's a big help to the community and the town and you know, I hats off to those people that are willing mm -hmm. to do that. So, more to come on that, but they're doing a lot of work down there. Chuck, did they approve the baseball field, the Little League rebuilding the baseball field as of yet? In terms of new clay? New clay and, and re- Yeah, so we we went, we met with, uh, that was part of the, the night when we discussed the uh, porta potties at the fields. We met with the, I can't think of the president of the Little League, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but yeah, we, they're coming in and digging out the, the clay that's in there. But, you know, any baseball, that comes down to training the coaches and the field people to take care of that stuff because it, it really, that's what happened there. I mean, it was, you know, it needs to be replaced because you know, coaches were brushing clay onto the grass or whatever, and it kills the grass. And you got to hire a company to come in and do that. And throwing that stuff down when it's speedy dry down when it rains turns the field into concrete. You know, just that's a lot of training, you know. But anyway, I didn't mean to digress. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Wise? Nope. Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Soon. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Mrs. Dowd is going to have an agenda item. Dr. Darty. I do have one short uh, report. Um, as you know, we've had a very collaborative relationship when it comes to the testing of water in our schools with the DPW and our facilities department. Uh, for the last four years, we've reported to you at the end of the summer, um, you know, how, how the testing has gone and any mitigations that we've taken. Uh, we found out recently that the Department of Environmental Protection is changing the guideline thresholds for lead in the water, uh, and we are working very closely with uh, the DPW and the Facilities Department to put together a plan on testing this summer and how we're going to address that, and at the end of the summer, uh, we will report out to you, um, you know, the results and, and the mitigations that we've taken. Thank you. You say, and by recently, they literally came yeah. out, I think, last Thursday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like a surprise. Mr. Wise. Just a point of qu a question on that, Dr. Doherty. From the past testing we've done last summer and, and whatnot, do we have an idea if we are at risk in any place against these new rules or not? We're Maybe actually, Mrs. Dowdy can answer that question. We're actually in the process. So this year, Parker and RMHS are up for in the three year cycle. So once those are done, we're actually going to go back through and look at the results and recalibrate and compare to what is on there. We sort of didn't want to stop the process we were already in, so we want to be able to come back. We have folks sort of looking at it now to say, what does it mean? How do we reassess it? So we, unfortunately, it is a little bit too early to give. That was our first question, is right. how quickly can we do it? And they're like, we have to kind of go through all of the information. So we're going to continue with Parker and the high school. And then once we have everything, we'll be able to look at the entire district where um, I don't want to put Jane on the spot, but on June 27th, we actually have um, Jane Kinsella will be here for the capital update. So we're hoping we might have more information at that time to see how are we addressing what, what does this actually mean and what are the next steps. Unfortunately, with less than a week with the information, it was right. not enough time for us to really pull it all together. But that was the first question we, we asked, and it, um, the timing of it just made it a little bit difficult. I guess the spirit of the question, and maybe you, maybe your answer is still the same, is historically we would have had part per million related measurements, right? And yes, they will change year over year, but are they way out of bounds? Or I mean, it's a significant 
significant change. change. So the, right, the state requirement is a significant change. Yeah, the, change. the state requirement is significant change. Significant mm -hmm. change, so that's why I don't want to be an alarmist and okay. say if, okay. you know, sky's falling until we actually have enough time to really look at it and say, well, what does it really gotcha. mean? And it, you know, it, some of them may be simple fixes. So we sort of, in fairness to the committee and the community, I would just ask for a little bit of time to, to dissect it. But it, it was a significant change, yeah. so that's why we want to make sure we're being Understood. due diligence. Yeah. Um, we have just one other item. So um, as part of Reading 375 this year, we have Friends and Family Day on June 15th, which is the last day. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. it's yes. the grand finale day. Right, grand finale. The fireworks are that night mm -hmm. after uh, Friends and Family Day, which is from 1030 to 3. And Linda had a, a sign-up sheet for us, so there's still some slots um, for those of us who are going to be here. And um, so just make sure. I couldn't get into the Google thing today, but. I answered you. You're on there. Chuck's on there. Um, we're trying to have two members for the time slot, so before we leave tonight, just kind of take a look at it, and we'll see what we can do. Um, I believe, if I'm right, Mr. Wise is away. I'm out of town that day. Yes. Now. Okay. You're gonna miss the fireworks. I'm gonna miss the fireworks. You get one per school committee tenure that you get to be out of town for that event. The entire tenure, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, for every no, every three-year term, you get one. You get a five-day trinket. <laughs> Oh, that might be a new policy that I just made up. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I totally understand. I think all of us have had that same situation, so um, there's plenty of us on board to cover it. Yes, it is it Father's Day, Day weekend. It's all, so that's always a problem, too. Mm -hmm. All right, so our agenda, the quarterly personnel update and the quarterly financial report. So, I can, Dr. Darty. I could do, I could do the quarterly personnel. Um, I was remiss earlier. Um, because she's not here, and I would have thanked her if she was here. So our Human Resources um, Administrator, Jen Bovey, uh, was the one that put together all of the milestone pins and certificates and awards that uh, you saw this evening. And that's, that's obviously a, a monumental task, and so I want to thank her for her efforts. Uh, she's actually on vacation today, a well, well-deserved vacation. Um, and she also put together this quarterly report and usually this quarterly report is the least um, busy report for hiring uh, in the school year because we're going towards the end of the school year. So as you can see from the report, um, we, uh, in terms of newly hired professional employees, we've hired 1.28 FTE, and the, those are paraeducators. Um, those are also the budgeted positions. And right now we have two open positions that we're currently filling. Um, one at Killam and, and one at, at Eaton. And as you can see, at the end of the report, we do have seven teacher retirements this year, which you saw many of them this evening. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if anyone has any questions on the quarterly report. The next one that you see will be a much more much bigger expansive right. report because that will be all of the hirings um, for the beginning of the school year. Doctor, this might be self-obvious, but so this, for instance, for the seven teacher retirements, those, the replacements are not, they will be no, no adequate replacements for them, but we don't have listed here um, who will be hot. No, that would be we in your, that, that would be in your 19-20 uh, school year. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is just for this school year, this, okay. this report. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Dowd. Thank you very much. We wanted to give a brief update for the third quarter budget, and I do want to let folks <coughs> know that we will be giving another update on June 20th, which yeah. we typically do as we get closer to the end of the year. We are still trending very well. We, Sorry. you know, I don't have I a good outside voice. Um, we are right now at about 277,000 projected surplus, um, which is about 0.6% of the budget, which is typically where we look to come out. We do, um, I do caution people that the reason we sort of project this is as we're getting close to year end, we still potentially had positions open that we're not sure whether or not they were filled, so we have substitutes coming in. Um, we're working with all of the 
district administrators, all of the principals to make sure we have turned over every stone to make sure any commitment of resources have been reflected so that we're not potentially missing anything. Also what we're doing, since we're just closing out May, which seems crazy, is a lot of our final receipts are coming in now for the athletics, for extracurricular, as well as use of school property. Right now the revolving account balances look very healthy. We're comfortable that we'll be able to take all of our offsets as we have budgeted, but again, it's sort of those last minute expenses or any revenues we were counting on to make sure they actually do come in before June 30th. But as of now, we do feel comfortable with the revolving accounts that we'll be able to take the balances that we have. You will notice, I'm happy to say right now, special education has a slight surplus. As a reminder, at the last school committee meeting, we, when we did the transfer, we did transfer slightly more than we anticipated we needed mm -hmm. just in case any additional items come up. So I'm working very closely with um, Sharon Stewart, Chris who is sitting in the back, Anne Marie Foley who is the administrative assistant for special education. We're actually now meeting twice a week to go through consultative services, tutoring, legal services. Um, believe it or not, even at this point, we're still monitoring all of the transportation because again, those change almost on a daily basis depending upon the number of students being transported, if they're making up days. Um, we're also getting the final summer school numbers so because some of the placements that we have, they actually have days in June that they go to that we need to make sure we capture the tuition and the transportation. So a lot of that information we're finalizing. Um, Sharon continues to work on um, settlements and agreements, so we're, we're tracking those. So each and every day we're updating these numbers. And if we do need any additional transfers, we'd be coming on June 20th for those. Um, we have had some good shifts. I'm gonna say good, we, had, we were able to relieve some of our um, homeless transportation because we had students that we were able to either combine buses or were no longer homeless or required to transport them. So balances we had been covering. The other item that tends to happen is if we have people on leaves of absence, we don't, I, we, I don't necessarily project the savings if they go on an unpaid leave because until they actually go on that unpaid leave, I never truly want to bank on it. We also have some individuals that are projected to come back at the end of the year. I have that in there even though there is that chance that they're going to come back for the last three to four days that they may not. I tend to be very conservative. The other part that gets tricky this time of year is substitute coverage because we tend to have teachers that may be out using their time now before the end of the year. So our substitute coverage tends to go up a little bit. But so using personal days and maybe some that aren't <coughs> returning from leave. Yeah. So we have um, some of that coverage that needs to happen or we've had a couple of additional teachers that have gone out that are on paid leave that we now have long-term sub in place for them. So we try to encumber some of that money now and then we free it up as we go. We did want to let folks know that um, Sharon and I had talked about that we were getting ready to file our claim with DESE for extraordinary relief related to circuit breaker. We did go through that process which does help us for our end of year filing which is due I think July 3rd which is always great timing to have that due right before the 4th of July holiday. We did just find out that we did not qualify for extraordinary Ugh. relief, which is a disappointment, but the silver lining, if there is one, is that most of the filing is already done, so we're prepared oh. for. So a large portion of the work required for the filing of the extraordinary relief is, is, already is, completed, is also which, applicable to the yeah. year. Okay. And we've made the determination, um, which I will be working with Jennifer when she starts in July, that every year we are going to go through this process and we will complete the forms, send in the filing, um, just in case we do qualify for it. So we feel it is a very good exercise to do that, but we, we did not qualify for it. Mr. Robinson. Did they <clears throat> give you an explanation or just a letter saying you don't qualify? It's a letter, but we didn't hit, we did not hit the dollar threshold. You have to, your claim has to exceed certain percentages and we just did not. So did we, we knew that when we were mailing it in basically? We, we were pretty confident that we were not going to get it, but at the time of the last update, we hadn't completed all of the forms, but we were pretty sure we were not. But one of the items we are looking at as we're going through 
the process and preparing for next year and the year after is really looking at how we're structuring items to, to look to see to maximize the circuit breaker. So we do plan to continuously go through this process because we have committed to the community and the committee that we will leave no stone unturned mm -hmm. when we're looking at items. And a couple of the other things we are also doing, you might notice shifts for some of the smaller cost centers where we've had some salary savings, um, specifically within facilities, relatively small cost center, but we are looking at items that we are now able to look at. We have a lot of aging radios, and as we're working through a lot of the security and a lot of the other items, we're actually looking to start to replace some of those. So we've reallocated some of those salary savings within that cost center to keep it within there for items that we know we need that we're able to take care of now that is going to be very helpful for us because we have a lot of people that have 15 plus year old radios that they're carrying that we really need to start replacing. So we're being very strategic as we're looking within each of the cost centers, how can we best utilize any of those savings that we've had. So we've reflected that in here as well. Uh, Mr. Robinson. Oh, thank you. No, um, go ahead. So the, the and I, I gotta be careful because I don't know what we, we can talk about, but does, can that go over to the uh, capital plant program that we just got a Approved by town meeting. No, the these radios. are the actual, um, like the one the facility, the walkie talkies at facility. So those have always been operating items. We did not contemplate that. We try to replenish 10 to 15 each year, and we also have a lot more, especially in the elementary schools for the kids, the little kiddos out at recess to make sure the paras and everyone have them. So they're much more of an operational day to day item. So to the extent I can buy 10 to 15 of them each year and cycle out the old ones and also put more in circulation is more what this is as opposed to an entire replacement of an entire system. Dr. So these Knox. are the people you see walking around with the black masking tape holding the radios. Together. <laughs> <laughs> Same ones that are driving low cars. <laughs> Dr. Doxer. Um, that was actually the question you saw flash across my face. Um, my other question, though, was, um, and I might be confused on this, but um, did it impact our application at all that the town wonderfully stepped up to no, help? That um, actually yeah. would be for next, next year. year. Next year. That's what I was. Yeah. And that okay. does not, that, the way the circuit breaker works is you look at each individual student and if that individual student hits the threshold that becomes part of the total dollars available that the circuit breaker percentage gets applied to so the 300,000 won't impact that right. at all. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Wise. Um, I'm going to play the ignorant card again a little bit. Um, just trying to understand the math on page two of your presentation and what the top I should have brought my class. what the top section yep. means versus the bottom section oh, because absolutely. I'm just not everybody at home and I know yep. I don't necessarily understand how it all obviously 277 277 equals each other but so special ed versus special ed yes. those numbers aren't the same so yep I can, can definitely walk through that so one of the changes we had made this year was the feedback we had received was where so the top section on page two is where the savings and or deficits are coming from so that's looking at Salary savings district-wide, the first number of that is if I look across all five cost centers, how much I may have from salary savings, whether it be positions remain open, hiring differences, unpaid leaves of absence. So we just said in total people were curious what is the swing in your salaries. The special education number, that is just the expenses. And the reason we were looking at that is typically when we've had expense tr budget transfers it's related to special education in in my long tenure of two years it's always been related to expenses which would be the transportation tuition and legal expenses so when I redesigned the memo I think it was the beginning of this year or last mm -hmm. year we wanted to carve that out separately so we could put more color to so it if you will so would you Mr. Weiss sorry, line of questions okay. would you say that then in this this 204,000 is, for lack of a better way to say, over budget for those categories yes. from last year, out of district placements, out mm -hmm. of district transportation, out of legal services to support that, et cetera. Yes. 
Okay, and the top line is under budget from a salary perspective across all categories, yes. whether yes. it's admin, regular mm -hmm. day, special, you know, et cetera. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. And then the other expenses is across all five cost centers, w areas where we're over or under. And the reason that is now flipped to looking as if it's over is because we're reallocating some of the salary savings towards expenses. So where I was saying we have, we're buying some of the radios, we're doing other items, that's because we've been able to use some of the salary savings oh, towards expenses. that. So this went towards how do we be as transparent as possible to let people mm -hmm. know exactly what we're doing and how we're moving items. The second one down below is because I felt it's yeah, still. Yeah, well, just oh, one second. Sorry. So the other expenses though is five cost centers or four because the special oh, education four, is. you are correct. Okay. Sorry, I, I misspoke on yeah. that one. Thank it's, you. It's the four other cost yeah, centers other because special, special education ed. is yes. called out separately. Yeah. And then the bottom one is because I still need to report to the school committee by cost center so that you know how we're doing by each specific cost center. So this is a combination of salary and expense savings within each of the five cost distinct centers. cost centers. Okay. So that was why we were doing it this way. With the, yep, Mr. Wise, sorry. Sorry, no problem. Um, so just on the 200,000 for the special ed, yes. we are quote over budget. Um, if you look at the next page on page three, we prepaid 300,000. Last year. That was last year. That was lot. We were okay. able to pay. So the way that this works, um, and that'll be another item we'll talk about in June when we okay. have sort of some of the final figures if we're looking to do any more transfers. Towards the end of the year, the discussions we have at central office as we're looking at where we are, do we have remaining salary savings when we've sort of satisfied all of our other, our technology is good, our facilities, we've done our curriculum, we've done everything we need to. We, under Mass General Law, you have the ability to prepay up to three months of tuition per student for the following year. There are no limits or caps on how much dollar-wise, but it is a three-month per child. We are very, I will say we're very precise on this because the way the rule works, if I, which I will pick on you because I sat next to you, if I prepay Tom Wise at a specific school, I am wed to that. If we are successful, we bring you back, you don't go, that money goes back to the town. So we go student by student and look at areas where we're very confident they will satisfy the three months. So each year we look to try to prepay approximately 300,000 because we know how easy that number can change quickly in the following year. So we will be looking, we're working right yep. now to look at what, if any amount, we'll be able to mm -hmm. prepay. So we will come back in June and say we're comfortable, we can do this if we need to do any final transfers. I truly feel that's one of the most fiscally responsible things I can do because it mm -hmm. is my most unpredictable number in the, in the budget. And we know next year we're, we, we're short in the budget, so. But we do feel it's important to remind people that that's what we do. Okay. Okay. Um, just to clarify, so, the, so if the in the scenario you explained, the money would go, it goes back to free cash. It goes back the to general free fund. Cash. At general fund yeah. town free cash. Yeah. So it basically we lose that money from our budget allocation from yeah. town meeting. So but it's the we don't only like to do that. Yeah. You're able to legally prepay yeah. expenses for the following well, you know, year. Sure that you're sure that you're sure. You know that yeah. students go down you, to school. Exactly. I think um, I'm going to Mrs. Richie. Williams. Yes. So the the three hundred thousand we prepaid three hundred thousand in what year? June, June of two thousand and eight. Yes, yeah. FY eighteen that helped to offset the FY nineteen tuition. <laughs> yeah, and then we'll if we pre to do and we're going to try to do year. the same this year. So this June of nineteen we will look to prepay twenty tuition. Right for school year FY nineteen yes. twenty. I, trust me, we I go through this all the time where I'm like, what, FY, what year am I? It's confusing. It to be on a calendar year. If we were calendar, I would be happy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense, Alicia? No, but I'll be I, I think if we, we do a little graphic, oh, we'll get you, it. It's funny you say that we actually do have that. I, oh, I does left. Chris have it? Chris, we, we sit there and we're like, oh. we're this year, but it's this year, and it's the three months of this. So, yes, we have it. I, I like 1231 for 
person. Yeah. Any other questions? Just, uh, all Thank right. you. Um, okay, so we have the next part of our agenda is um, two policies. So just for a little um, background, uh, I was on the committee back in 2007 when the committee did um, a large number of policies at that time. So school committees periodically review policies. Uh, there's a couple mechanisms that, that key us off to review policies. One is we get notifications, which the superintendent and Mrs. Ingleson um, also get as our, I guess, secretary of the school committee, technically. Um, and it may point out that, um, you know, suggest some updates. So um, we have been looking at a, these policies for a little while, trying to figure out how to fit them in on the agenda. Um, and so tonight we have, um, well, our minutes policy. And then um, Dr. Darty and I also reviewed the um, public input policy. So Dr. Darty and I spent quite a bit of time sort of going through the minutes. Uh, we always consult with uh, MASC, and we always consult with often at least one of our attorneys. It's a, yeah, depending on the policy, policy. either our, uh, Colby Brunt or Michael Joyce. Right, so um, that's sort of the, the process to bring that forward. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'm gonna let Dr. Darty sort of introduce the um, minutes policy. And this is a first reading, so typically what we do here is we would go through it. We'll um, be able to just ask some questions. If there's anything that we want a little bit more research on, we can ask Dr. Darty to do that for us. And then um, we, um, the board has to vote to approve the first reading, and then there's a second reading. And then the, there, the, in order for the policy to go into effect, it has to pass both the first and the second reading. And this time, what you have in your packet, I did ask Dr. Darty because all of us uh, look at things a little differently. So you will find both the current policy, the red line policy, and the clean copy of the new policy if we were to approve that, just to help people read it a little bit better. Everybody has a different way of looking at it. So, Dr. Dar, do you want to um, begin the sure. uh, introduction on the minutes policy? So, the minutes policy um, is the first one. So, I'm going to I'm referring to the red line version. That's my learning yeah. stuff. Um, so, what you see is the uh, the current policy with overwritten the MASC changes um, and some other changes in consultation with Laura Jem, the town clerk, which. Do you have color copies like I yeah. do? Okay, mm -hmm. so it's the, the purple, uh, which is the, looks like the fourth paragraph, um, is uh, reflect the changes that Laura Jem suggested. The MASC policy does not include our town bylaws, and there is slight differences in the town bylaws ref, uh, in relation to minutes than uh, MASC's recommendation. So that's why you see those changes. So just along that line, um, we this is the, we were um, attempting to do this minutes policy at some point earlier this year, um, and then we took it off the agenda. And part of it was because um, basically we weren't really aware of that. And although we hadn't changed anything in this last paragraph at that time, people interpreted it or looked at it. You could read it almost as if we were trying to take something away and not do something, and that really was absolutely not the case. So um, Laura and I and Dr. Doherty went through this um, to make sure that it reflected um, what she does and, and that it's consistent with the charter um, as well as the state laws. So if people have any other questions and if you note the... Um, if you need to look at the policy cleanly, the next page after the red line is how the policy will read. So, Is that time for discussion? Yes. Okay. Um, so, I guess I should have put this in the, in the reporting section. I attended the open meeting training, open meeting law training on Thursday. And one of the things, knowing that this was, or last Thursday, knowing that this was going to be coming up, I was paying attention to what they were saying about minutes. Um, and they mentioned a few things that I don't think this covers yet. And in fact, the note kind of goes against what they're suggesting. Um, in particular, they mentioned that if there's a dissent in the discussion, it should be specifically noted in the minutes. Um, 
whether it's a vote dissent or not, if there's a dissent in the conversation greater overall, it should be specifically noted in the minutes as if, you know, five of us or six of us are having a conversation, if two of us are having an opposite view but four having one view, then the minutes should denote that in some way, shape, or form. So not necessarily discussion as it's listed here, but if there's a dissent of an opinion of some sort, that should come up as part of the minutes as, as one of the things they mentioned there. So that that's not, that I'd have to look at that, but that's definitely like not consistent with the guidance from MASC in I terms agree. of, you know, We're recording um, yeah. basically the votes. Yep. So um, I, I don't, um, I guess I'd like to sort of check a little bit more on that, but it's definitely not consistent because it goes against sort of the idea of this is not meant to be a transcript, and mm -hmm. that puts it a little bit more into the transcript. Yep. Um, so, Mr. Robinson just asked um, where I got the training, and the training was offered by uh, the Attorney General. Um, and so, the, the actual the, the two people that are responsible right now for the Division of Open Government by the Attorney General that do the rulings against open meeting law questions and response mm -hmm. were the two people presenting um, the training as it was as a WebEx type training, essentially. Um, so I thought that was interesting because yeah. I agree. I didn't see it in the MASC policies either. I, I did see that some of our previous minutes had a little bit more along those lines. The minutes might, themselves? Our minutes had yes, more it, along those right. dissent. So again, not the full transcript of the discussion, mm -hmm. but, you know, Tom disagreed or in the case of our f former, former colleague or your former colleague, Nick disagreed, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, just something along those lines was something that was part of the conversation. Mr. Robinson. So I had a, are we talking about the, I have a question on the, the policy. Did we? Yeah, I, so I don't. So my, yep. uh, I guess, what, I mean, I think if we, I mean, I, I, I understand that the, the guidance is given that the, the minutes aren't supposed to be a transcript of the meeting, but Back in the day before YouTube and all that, those things, I think minutes probably were more robust, right? Uh, so I think that uh, I I can see why that we say that, but I think we, you know, maybe we we, we should somewhere refer because some people want to see the transcript that we should be referring people that go to the minutes to thinking they're going to get a transcript that they can go to YouTube or something. I don't know whether that's a disclaimer that so we put on every. I believe right now we put the YouTube link in the minutes. So the we do. Okay. Yeah, oh, the, we so do. The RCTV we do. YouTube. We started we that about a year ago. A transcript of the meeting in the minutes. If Basically, that's the case. We that provide link. a virtual link to it, right? So. Mm -hmm. So then we then that that uh, that sentence and shouldn't be in the minutes then that says that these minutes are not intended to be a trans because they are if they're providing that link right well, I think the written minutes aren't maybe we could clarify that to say the written minutes are not a transcript of the meeting um, and then you we could add to that that the YouTube link is provided we, t we intend to in case something happens where it's broken where it falls down we should give ourselves some creativity or space there in case RCTV can't record for some reason. Yes. Right. I think right? it, we yeah, can't yeah. mandate that so it's in we, there. So maybe we say uh, the, these minutes, these uh, written minutes are not a transcript, yeah. transcript of the meeting, however, uh, a link to the, for that transcript, you can go to a YouTube link. Right, you could even say most meetings will have a YouTube You would say if the meeting is being video recorded, oh. a link will be provided in the minutes. Right. I will admit I don't know if a YouTube link is a permanent item or if there's a point in time in which a YouTube link in and of it I would just yeah. there might need to be wording about to yeah. the extent it's available mm -hmm. only because I'm these will become permanent records. I'm not sure a link is a permanent yeah, the, just so that people understand how, how that, that this, the minutes become permanent also. So once the minutes are um, approved by us, and then Dr. Darty and his staff send them to the town clerk, right. uh, which is electronically, yes? You, you send them, she prints them. Laura Jem has to print the, meeting, the minutes out. She stamps them, 
and then scans them into right. the electronic them document them. Yeah. system. That's why when you look at them via the link, it's like, why isn't this just the Word document? Okay, because it's not a PDF, because that's why it has to be scanned in. And so then that is the permanent, um, the permanent record and on our school committee page right at the top it says link to school committee minutes and it goes directly to the, the town website where all those minutes are archived so it always points it always points right back to that source which is the one that's recorded by the town clerk well can we just do some research before then before we approve the policy as to whether or not that YouTube link is permanent or not or I think we can, or we can at least put in here that the the written minutes, right, are not are not a transcript of the meeting. Um, uh, when, when the meetings are recorded, the RT the uh, link is provided, and then we can find out what the retention is on those for RCTV. I, uh, yeah, but, I think, but as long as the I don't think I mean I think people go to minutes because they want to know what happened in the meeting, and if these are scrubbed down to nothing then, then uh, you know, they need to be able to go somewhere to see what happened, right? So that's I, all I'm saying. I agree with that. And um, the Attorney General actually has a solution to that, which I realize is complicated because there are choices. I mean, these are a lot of work for um, our scribe, Linda. Um, and. They're never going to make everybody happy. There are always going to be people with different filters who think something should have been in that shouldn't be. But I thought a compromise was what was written in the September 25th, 2017 Attorney General um, public body checklist for creating and approving meeting minutes. And they say the wording that they use is minutes must include an accurate summary of the discussion of each subject and then see a uh, policy. The summary does not need to be a transcript, but should provide enough detail so that a member of the public who did not attend the meeting could read the minutes and understand what occurred and how the public body arrived at its decisions. What I thought would help too, so that those don't have to be so detailed, is that if we do, if we can, when a recording is made, it can, um, the minutes would follow the order of the meeting as opposed to like our minutes said that the minutes follow the way the agenda was supposed to go. But it might be helpful if our minutes go the way the meeting actually went because sometimes things get changed. And if it goes in the same order as what the meeting actually was, then people can refer more easily to the recording to fill out the details that just can't possibly all be in because it's not a transcript. So, I, did I that make if, sense? If I can I, just answer, don't we have a f format we have to follow for the town clerk that it has to be in the order of the agenda? So it so does reflect the change order. Yeah, it reflects the change. Awesome. I thought I read in the last minutes it reflected the order it was supposed to be in and not the order that it was. That might be the disclaimer on the Oh, all right. Because that made me concerned that if someone wants to use the link, which is wonderful that it's in the minutes now, <coughs> that would make it hard for them to find the information that they're looking for. And I think the easier that we make that information available, the more likely they're going, people are going to go to our minutes rather than going on social media to find information that might or might not be accurate. And so I think we're dealing with something different than what we dealt with in 2007. In 2007, Facebook was just maybe, I don't even know if it existed then. It didn't. And now we have another reason to make sure that we have accurate information at people's fingertips. And I realize that having the recordings when we're able to have it is very helpful, but people don't always have time to rewatch a whole meeting. So if we have the information, like the Attorney General said, that just um, not a transcript, but enough detail that a member of the public could get a sense of what happened at the meeting and then they could get it filled in from the recording, 
that that would be a good compromise. And it also would take people off the hook. If something wasn't included in writing, it's still there if the recording was done. Well, who, can I? Yeah, Mr. Who's Robinson. going to do that, though? I mean, you're creating, that's you, creating work for some. If you're going to ask someone now to write a, a paragraph or whatever on each thing that right. we discuss. Actually, I think that our minutes have been doing that. I mean, I think we basically, we haven't gone, can I finish one yeah. second? I'm sorry. Go ahead. But I think that um, our minutes have been reporting on the things that have come up before us and some of the discussion, but not, um, and that, but I'm afraid with a policy that goes to just reporting on what the motions were as stated and what we voted on with a clause at the bottom that says we have to vote in order to include anything else, that that's going to leave things out. If there is public comment or if we put something to quote Nick, Mr. Blevin, um, if we put something on a parking lot, that's not something we necessarily vote on. I don't want to add more votes that we have to make, but at the same time that could be requested to go in the minutes. Or like Mr. Wise said, if there's a dissenting opinion, it could get noted. But the, it's not a transcript. It would just be basically we discussed X, Y, and Z, or certain questions were raised. I'm not trying to make more work. I think that Ms. Engelson has done an amazing job capturing our meetings up till now. What I want to stop is the slide backwards to less information. And the policy as written it frightens me because legally we could go to much less I, information. I think that what the first of all the policy, the current policy is much more bare than let's say what Mrs. Engelson has been capturing. I think right. it takes an enormous amount of time though, and it requires watching and rewatching the video to capture the conversations. And I think that's the piece that if we have the minutes and we have the link to the minutes and we have the video and it's in the order of the meeting um, in general people can should be able to refer to that so um, I think the 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 difference is this is um, the new statement that the minutes are not a transcript of the meeting the only the difference here is that um, the minutes include an accurate summary of the discussion of each subject and it doesn't need to be a transcript and so from my perspective it's it can it should be able to be s simple enough to say that the committee discussed the um, quarterly HR report right that was on the agenda the committee discussed that and then if we vote we vote but first of all that has a report and um, you know that has that has information in the meeting I just don't I, I I am a little reticent to have these be a very lengthy um, a very lengthy capturing and it taking an, an enormous amount of time and getting into the into the issue of having to have Ms. Engelson watch the, the video over and over again to make sure the words are accurate to the video that doesn't make a lot of sense to me so I I, I, I see what you're saying and if it's um, if it's a question of we would have to change this statement in the notes that and to add in that the minutes include a, a, a uh, accurate summary of the discussion of each subject, yeah. but not a transcript. Okay. I, I think it's great to include mm -hmm. that. Dr. Jarvis, caveat. I, I just had a question more. If you use the minutes that you approved this evening as an example. Are you seeing an increase in uh, depth of the minutes with what you're stating or the same? No, pretty much a maintenance uh, it, of it, it. That's what I'm trying to get a visual of what you're So Yeah, I'm not asking for a lot more detail. When I want to go back to meetings, I often go back to our minutes and my notes, but the minutes to see what was recorded to get a sense to bring the meeting back to me. And I would hate to lose that. And, and I don't need all the details, but, and so I'm not asking for more. I just don't want us to slide to a lot less. So, and I understand your concerns about 
transcribing words, and that's not what I'm asking for. Getting the gist of a conversation and the pros and cons um, is, is sufficient for me. I just don't want us to have to take a vote to decide that certain information should be included or not. Um, and so it, it and what, is the, can I, yeah. what does the town clerk suggest that the, is that the attorney, the AG's office that you, Linda, that you No, this is, to? it's actually, well, it's the from attorney the general's school office. committee. It's, and, and yeah. we're also, we've got a guidance from the MASC. MASC so it what says, does the town clerk Sign on to so that the this Laura check reviewed this she reviewed this she, and she, she was fine with the change that we made right. right this this checklist has also the same checklist is also provided by the MASC um, so I mean certainly the policy that they recommend they recommend in full knowledge of the, um, AG. the AG right this was dated March 13th so what you saw recently might have been newer I don't know I mean 2013 so what you saw recently, Tom, could have been newer, but basically the, the MASC provides that, that sort of public body checklist. So it does, it does say, as Linda says, that's in the checklist. I'm just saying that the MASC then provides the policy that basically we have here. If we wanted to change this, we could add, I just, again, I'm a little, I get concerned about how much work, that it's not going to be more work and create for for not a significant value, but we could add that the minutes include the written minutes or the minutes include an accurate summary, but are not a transcript of the meeting. So to that state, the statement in the notes right now, it just reads the minutes are not a transcript of the meeting. We could add that the minutes include an accurate summary, but are not a transcript of the meeting. And then that would incorporate sort of what the attorney general has um, in the checklist that they recommend. Are you in, uh, I, I like that, um, and I'm wondering, are you taking out the discussion of each subject intentionally? Yeah, or I, just I am, I'm just saying that, I, I am, I feel like we should <coughs> follow the guidance, we should comply, you know, with, with the law, but I believe I was capturing sort of what that would say, say but um, yeah, I, I don't know that we need to keep going with that. Yes, it does say should provide enough detail so that a member of the public who didn't attend the meeting could read the minutes and understand what occurred and how the public body arrived at its decisions. Again, this was in two 2013. We're in 2019. This is 2017, and it's the same thing. Same thing. It's, okay. I so looked it to see whether changed. it was updated. I, I feel like because we also have the video, we record all of our meetings, it it, it's not as important to me that we put that in there, and I feel like if we were to change this to say, again, the minutes, um, the minutes include an, an accurate summary, but are not a transcript of the meeting. Um, and then we already do, we, and then we can add that um, if the meeting has been recorded, there is, and we'll, we can if check on the If you desire a transcript, please right. refer to a tra right, a transcript can be found on the video if, 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 it was, if it was available, which, again, not tonight. Tonight, I don't know. I guess we're on, yeah. <laughs> Ms. Borowski. I jump in. I have a couple. I have, I have a couple. Is that okay? Yeah. So based on that discussion that, that just happened, I actually didn't hear a lot of disagreement. Mm -hmm. Right? We want a summary. We don't want a transcript. Nobody. Right. So I guess my thinking is it says a summary of each, sum, of, of each subject. I feel like as written covers us, mm -hmm. and my suggestion would be, um, and this is sort of directed to Dr. Doxer, so if I'm misinterpreting what you said, jump in and correct me, but I think you have concerns that there will be a change in the culture of how we do minutes, like how they look going forward. I want to make sure they still capture some of the discussion. And so I guess my response to that is, will we vote that's on the minutes? Me. So that's the opportunity, like, having the policy be in alignment with um, all of the appropriate legal guidance, but we as a committee still are very much empowered to say that um, we'd like, you know, in the future them to be fleshed out a little more, or this was a little too, like, there's gonna be a certain amount of subjectivity in what an accurate summary is. Right, and you could, you yeah. could put five right, people It's in together. the first, I forget, it's in number one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that if this covers us legally, then my inclination 
is, is to leave it the way it is. Um, I think Mr. Wise brought up a really interesting point about the dissent being included. I liked, um, I liked Mrs. Webb's response to that, which is let's check with our legal counsel and MASC and see what their reaction to that is. Either yes, we're aware that it's, the, here's why we don't do it or you should do that. I would, a concern I have about that is if we're having a discussion and I start from a place of dissent in the discussion, I, you know, you just said something and I disagree with that. I'm not, you know, here's why I disagree with that. And through the discussion, I come to a different opinion. Now the minutes reflect me dissenting on someone on something that if you actually read further, I voted in favor of based on the discussion. So I'm not sure that the minutes reflecting dissent and discussion actually helps the public. It could muddy the waters. It, mm -hmm. Like you I definitely can. want it to, I, I would suggest that the minutes reflecting the vote show yeah. dissent, like the, the votes say where the committee landed. I'm not sure the back and forth, because I've seen a lot on this committee that people, move, which is a wonderful thing, through dialogue, move their position. So just something to think about. Just a point of clarification yeah. on that. I think you can say arrived at an agreement, right? That's a, it's a process to cover what you're talking about. But if, and, and the vote obviously does say if somebody did not vote along with something, but if there's more to it than just I did not agree and I'm putting uh -huh. one in five to one, there should be more context in that. So right? I, I mean that's that's right. the sent that's the sentiment that <coughs> came through in that training was not necessarily that just you know it's five to one, but if there's content behind the dissent sure. as part of the vote, then it should include that information. Sure, that could be in the summary, right? Sure. The, so the summary there is a vote and then there's a summary and Absolutely. you know the or the the center can submit to the secretary to put into the minutes their their dissenting opinion, just like you know the Supreme Court. Supreme right. Court does. Well, right. Or if it wasn't pr reflected, right, the way that when you, we get the minutes to review and it's not reflected the way that you thought, right? You, it's 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 something that you can sort of we can call the day before. I'm going to want to change this or whatever. I don't th feel like this is accurate, so. I think Mr. Robinson is exactly right. right. You know, if I dissented on something and my vote reflects that and I don't feel that the minutes adequately express why and that's important to me, I make a motion to add to the minutes my, yeah, and the committee would I think generally be agreeable to that kind so, of a thing. Can I make one more tiny yeah, thing that I think hopefully will be very, um, in the purple, this is so minor, but it says that the town clerk and the public library who will post the approved minutes on the town website and make them available to the public. Fine. Oh, yeah, no, the no, last no. sentence on, in purple says, a link to the approved minutes will also be on the school department website. And my proposed friendly amendment is that we changed will also be to, will be posted to. In the event that the website is down for a few hours, in the event that oh. the server crashes, okay. I wouldn't want someone to say that I went to the website, the minutes were not there. Okay. Yep. So You're a link to the, the approved policy. minutes so our obligation will is to be post them to the website. posted to. Yep the school department website. And that just makes it consistent with what is happening on the municipal side in the sentence before. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, I just want to just summarize. So right right now, the two sort of follow-up items are um, perhaps to have reach out to. Uh, can I can I just get what Mrs. Ms. Brosky said clarified? Oh, Dr. Yeah. Because maybe I misunderstood. I In the last purple sentence, it says a link to the approved minutes will also be on the school department website. I'm suggesting we change that to read, a link to the approved minutes will also be posted to the school department website. So Laura said that then they are not the official minutes. They, oh, because. That's, oh, the, it's, oh. it's the town website that has to have the official minutes. So you're, to not, say po posting. Yeah, you're not posting them too. Well, I oh, thought it was a good post. idea. She has to print them, stamp them. Gotcha. So micro beach them or whatever correct. it is. Yeah, but Jean, it, there is the, the timeline, right, is there also, so within there, right, like within three Thank meetings you. or 30 days, so, yeah. Oh, that's true. I, There's I'm an example where I now. dissented and have come to consensus. There you go. <laughs> um, hold on. I just wanted to sort of summarize. I think so far the two, sort of the two items to follow up would be uh, maybe a discussion with Dorothy about the open meeting law, the dissent, mm -hmm. and just how that's represented and where they feel that that's covered in the policy. And also just some checking on how long the RCTV, um, how those are archived or kept. And we may want to refer to them in this policy or um, whether we want to refer to them in this policy or not, we still have to sort of decide what modification we might make to refer to them maybe in the notes. 
right under this in the note that the minutes are not a transcript of the meeting it does say earlier that there's a, a summary of each subject and that was where we talked about um, adding the note that if the meeting has been recorded the link is provided in the minutes the link to the uh, recording is provided in the minutes Ms. Robinson. So, Gail, are you saying that they just eviscerate in the cyberspace or they sure erase them? Because we can take them over, can't we, and keep them forever? Maybe the town would have to. Yeah. What's right now? I'm going to check with Laura. Um, yeah, because the select board, too, right? TV because yeah. it would probably apply to all of us. I'm just not sure because, well, I guess maybe now they are more of a town since it's part of the budget, but it's sort yeah. of how long theirs last and whether or not we can pull them in, it just becomes a storage yeah. mm -hmm. sort of Dr. issue if, if we then have rights to it. But we can, and if RCT ever went away, if they ever went away, like how does this all, this Bill, Bill will be calling me in the morning to claim that. But I just want to make sure we don't set ourselves up for a potential. It should be a quick, we can mm -hmm. ask the questions of them. Uh, and, Dr. Uh, Doherty. The, there is another option since that is not really part of any law. Right. You don't put it in. You mean no? It, it, it's not. It's not a legal obligation to provide right, the to link. Video so, record. so right. it doesn't necessarily need to be in the policy. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. So it's a nice to have. We have it there, and if the internet's forever, then it'll be there. And well, you know, I was. Can I? I wasn't even thinking of the law. I was just thinking of people like to go and see what was on the, what happened at the meeting. Now, I'm not trying to make sure I'm just dancing around the law. I want to, people want to know what happened, they can go find it. You know? Right, I'm not suggesting we don't put it yeah. in the minutes. What I'm saying is if you put it in the policy, now it's, mm -hmm. you have to do it. Unless we say when available. If available. Right. You give yourself a caveat. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm sorry. I didn't yeah. Have to. Mrs. Borowski and then Mr. Wise. Actually, both of those last two comments, that was something I had thought of. Like, for instance, you would not want to specifically mention a company like YouTube. Correct. Right? Because Correct. that could change, and RCTV's delivery mechanism could change. So I think you have to be really careful and broad in how you'd say it. And I think Dr. Doherty brings up another good point. There's what we do. There's our practice, which is, of course, we want that video to be completely um, available to the public, and I'm fully supportive of it. But the policy is about minutes. What our minutes are, what our minutes do. And I, I could see an argument for mm -hmm. not including things that I would fully support and expect to continue that tradition. But if the policy is about what minutes are, there is the option to just not include it in there and just have it be part of our protocol and procedures. Mr. Wise. Right. Linda was actually first, but I'm okay. happy to go if she wants me to. Um, I just, if, thank you, Mr. Wise. I've got to learn to be more assertive. Um, I just, I had um, thoughts about what Ms. Zabrowski had said in terms of sort of the forensic changing of the minutes. I know that that actually sends Mrs. Engelson back to the tape to watch and rewatch. And if she were able to capture it in the brief notes that she's taking during the meeting, then I, I don't think that actually saves time to make it us, whether we disagree with the minutes as printed or not. I, I think that if we have um, <coughs> a brief summary and that that's, it's hard to go back and say, I disagree with the minutes that way. I mean, even if I've done that and I've gone back and I've watched it and put it written down verbatim what I heard, she still has to go back and verify. Um, so I feel like I don't want to make this so bare bones. There's no requirement to capture information. To your point, it can change, but I don't want it sliding away with a different school committee, with a different culture. I want to make sure that there's information there, but it doesn't have to be everything because if we say the recording, not YouTube, you know, being careful of all that, when it's available to what Mr. Um, sorry, Chuck. Robinson. <laughs> Robinson <laughs> said, Chuck. you know, I think that people want information right now. Um, and 
that we need to make it available to them. So I like having not, not a transcript, but a little more information in, in our minute policy. So um, Mr. Wise and then we'll follow up. Okay, so a couple of things if I may. Mm -hmm. um, one is I appreciate that our minutes now specifically call out the fact that documents will be included. Um, and I, I would even take, pres presume we take that out of the note and put it up into like number four. I think the note is kind of unofficial and seems, I would almost strike the note altogether and move some of that thing up to number four if we're refactoring this. A, because that aligns with MGL 22. B, because we have not posted packets to the town meeting website since 2015. Um, and C, the town meeting website is plain text searchable. And all, all the documents that are posted there can be searched and found much more efficiently. Which leads me to the second point, um, which is I do agree with Linda that an accurate summary, mm -hmm. a summary, not word by word, not play by play, uh, should be included as it is similar to what is included right now um, because of that plain text searchability and because it's quick on that town website to search for a topic of discussion and pull it back every time it has, been hap it has happened over the last five or ten years. And yes, I have used that, and yes, I hope to continue to use so. And that's another reason why, while we may say that YouTube has the quote transcript, YouTube is not plain text searchable. Mm -hmm. um, and what, another reason why Laura prints it out and scans it in is because she scans it in as a text searchable OCR recognized mm -hmm. PDF document that can be searched and found, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's another concept that I think we need to consider as part of this process is that not everything can be found in video yet, soon we'll be able to, with AI and ML, take it all apart. But in the meantime, the plain sex searchability of the minutes and for that matter, the packet, which should be part of it and now is being explicitly called to be part of it, right, um, should be make sure that we can plain text search it. So, so the packet meaning the documents used during the school committee meeting become part of the, so uh, you're sort of suggesting that this note really just move up to number four, Not become number thing. four. Um, yes, except, yes, and I, do, I think it's superfluous to say specific comments or discussion. I don't yeah, think you need it. Because we have it in the first yeah. item, and you could just add an accurate summary of each yes, subject. Exactly. So in number one, if you add an accurate summary uh, of each subject, yep. and then we strike that first sentence from uh, the note and make that number four. I would even say strike the minutes are not a transcript because the OML saw, says that as well. I mean, the, the MGL says that as well. If you go through all the def, def, different legal references that are there, they say it does not, it's not intended to be a transcript. So it's, it's duplicative to state, to state so. If we want to say it, then we can say it. But, right. The minutes are right, um, not intended to be a transcript. Right. I would act. Um, and, and one I'd more like thing. to keep it, but <laughs> two, two, two more. I'm not a, I'm not right, opposed right. to keeping it because it is not a transcript, but I don't think it's necessary. Right. Uh, two more quick things from an editing perspective. Um, just if you look at the final version of this, there's an extra space between the first and second bullet point. Um, yeah. You know, third and second and third is one space. First and second is two spaces. And there's an extra period at the end of available to the public in the last yes. paragraph above legal refs yep. um, that we can strike as part of the final version of this. So if I can uh, sort of summarize what we've just talked about, um, because if possible, I would like to try to approve the first reading. And then so um, for number one, um, where it says, uh, if during the meeting annotated to arrival departure times, um, an accurate summary of each subject and a list of documents and exhibits used at the meeting. Yep. Um, eliminate that space. Number two, number three is not not uh, notation of the formal adjournment. And then number four would basically bring the note up and I'd like to see it start with the minutes are not intended to be a transcript of the meeting. Documents used during a school committee may become part of the official record, must be maintained based upon their content in accordance with Commonwealth Public Records retention schedule. And that becomes basically number four. 
And then I think we've talked about the video record, and it may be best at this to leave that out of the policy, but as we know, Mrs. Engelson includes the video link in the minutes. And we've, we've done that, and we all can be accountable to make sure that that continues to happen um, in that extra period. So, uh, I'm sorry, I, can I just ask for clarification? Yes. So in, I think you're looking at the original oh, policy. Oh, no, okay. No, I'm not. Okay. I, yeah. I went to okay. that. Yeah. Um, sorry, I just needed a second to, to catch up with you. So you're saying, to my concerns, a summary of each subject an that accurate. really. accurate. We make that an, an accurate. accurate. So an accurate summary of each subject. Um, and then we bring the note up to number four. Yeah. And it begins with the minutes are not intended to be a transcript of the meeting. And we're not. Documents used during the school committee meeting, the rest of that we retain. We're not using okay. the first sentence. Specific yeah. comments in our discussions should only be included in the minutes as a result of a vote. And that, that makes. That is actually sort of covered in number two anyway. That idea that, that, that this is, that it is the official record. It must capture the, the votes, end. the resolutions, the motions, right? So, so the other question I had from my reading was, um, the other policy included something about remote. Not um, this policy, I don't think. That the minutes need to note that someone, it, well, I'm that not sure I buy uh, this, but that one. it needs to note. That's paragraph one, the date and time members present or, abs or absent annotated as to the arrival and departure times. Um, right, the, the other one specifically says if someone is joining remotely, it actually said, the other um, policy actually says why they're not here, but I don't personally think are that's important. What policy talking about, the original policy? No, no, with the um, Attorney General. Oh, okay, so. If, it says if one or more public body members participated that's a remotely checklist. in a meeting, yeah. the minutes must record all votes as a roll call vote, but it also above that says. Um, yeah, the name I of any member that, who participated in the meeting remotely. I believe yeah. you have a separate policy that talks yeah, about remote I participation. I think so, too, about remote. We have another policy that it's talks remote. about remote participation. Yes. I think that's in that policy, though. Right. Is what I'm saying. About it covers remote participation. Yes. And, and says that the minutes will include that. This one says if one or more body more public body members participated remotely in the meeting, the minutes must include the names of the individuals participating remotely. So can we cross-reference the remote it is, policy? It is actually already 9 CMR um, 940, 20, 940 CMR 29. No, but that's our, that's not, that's the legal ref, that's not our policy. Dr. No. Doherty said. Cross oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah, it is, but it is the, the legal, it, it, we have to be compliant to that. That is, the legal reference is there. Um, I don't know if I have that policy, but we do, you're saying just to list, to cross-reference right the next, remote after policy. after yeah. executive session. Yep. Okay. So we can list the. Yep. Could that be? Could that fall under the category of the dissent question that Mr. Wise raised? Can we just bring this to Colby and MASC and say a committee member mentioned this as a potential thing that needs to be included in the minutes? Can that be added as the do further research? Because to Dr. Doherty's point, if we have another policy that already covers it, I'm not sure we have to do that work right now. Maybe that. We're not done. at. Right. We're not changing. We're just cross referencing. It. Oh, okay. Oh, just right. down the down bottom. the bottom. The cross reference section. Cross reference section. Gotcha. that Sorry. policy. Yes. Yeah. Any, yep. any wording gotcha. in this? Yeah. Gotcha. So, um, <laughs> perhaps. I did capture all the changes. Okay, so <laughs> perhaps I'll uh, make the motion in this case. I, I um, motion that we approve the first reading of the minutes policy BEDG um, with the um, changes as noted and captured by the superintendent in item one. Um, it will read. Instead of a summary, it will read an accurate summary. Um, eliminate the space between one and two. Um, eliminate the extra period in the fourth paragraph. Oop, sorry. After three, we will um, have a number four. It will be what resides currently under the note, but eliminate the first sentence and begin with the minutes are not intended to be a transcript of the meeting, and then proceed with the rest of that statement. 
um, again, eliminate the extra period, and then also include as a reference, in the reference section, our policy on remote participation. Can I get a second? Second. 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 Ms. Sprowski. All right, so is there um, any further discussion on the first reading? No one read anything. We, well, we, we like <laughs> diced the whole thing apart. <laughs> All right. I'm so all glad right. MASC provided us that template. <laughs> yeah. All right. All those in favor? And that's six zero. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you for yeah. including the three phases. I thought that was really ha helpful. Oh, of yes. the document. Of the document. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, Dr. Darty, would you introduce the public participation at school committees sure. policy? Sure. Um, this actually came out as a result of was it the last meeting of the meeting before there was some discussion um, and then uh, there was some discussion around the Natick case outside of the meeting uh, so I, I did do some extensive research on the, the Natick case that happened about two, year, two and a half years ago now um, which the there the school committee for Natick did change their policy as part of a settlement agreement. It was not, um, it's not meant to be the policy that, um, that other school districts should follow, but it certainly should, uh, policy should capture some of the key points. So um, what I did was, and this policy you actually updated in 2016, right. um, I believe when Ms. Borowski was chair, uh, as a result of uh, some work that you did with MASC with Dorothy Presser. So I sent the 2016 policy and the Natick policy to uh, Colby, Bryant, our uh, Labor Council, to, to take a look at to make sure that um, we were okay and in compliance with any, anything that would come out of the, the Natick settlement. And so what you see in the red line piece is uh, the suggested changes by, by our legal counsel, um, which include crossing out um, an old number seven, inserting a new number seven, um, and a number eight, and crossing out an old number nine, which would then make number eight the number nine. Um, so, with those changes, uh, this this would fulfill any any requirements of public comment um, at your meetings. Right. And I, I would like to just add that to the committee that I know Dr. Darn and I both read um, sort of the entirety of the um, cases to understand <coughs> sort of exactly what did happen during those meetings. And um, I feel like, you know, our policy was on very solid ground and uh, as the 2016 version of it, and this certainly does um, improve it and, um, you know, would help to just sort of clarify um, what the proper responses would be. Um, I think that if you read this, if you do the same reading we did, you would, um, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? So they probably look back and say we could have done things differently. And this will definitely assure, but you'll see just by taking out this, you know, the idea that defamatory or abusive remarks, it, there's a judgment factor in that. So this changes it to stick to, you know, being people need to be respectful, but then it really focuses on that the public comment needs to be the things on the things within the committee's um, purview and authority. Um, so I think it does you know, clean that up a bit. Um, Mr. Robinson. Does this, uh, I'm just thinking we, so we, we probably, when did we start office hours? Before, ap, after 2016 or was it before? I'm because sorry, I didn't hear the question. Office quote. hours, we office started hours. office hours. Oh, No, you've had office that. hours for so a while. So, 20, you had, pro, you had it pre-2016. Yeah. is I, a, As long as I've been here, 2014. That is a, uh, a form of public comment. So we, but having said that, people will, 
regularly come to office hours to discuss things that are on the agenda that night. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that, uh, you know, I, do we have, do we have a, anything in our, pol is, is the, I don't think we have anything in our policies on office hours. No, and no. Maybe then, maybe then we should. Uh, I don't know. You know. I'm just thinking out loud. Uh, well, the, when people come for office hours, so there's typically only there's two members. Yeah, of it's the committee, not public. So the committee is not um, in session. Yes. So it's a um, little bit different. It'd be interesting if there's some. Um, but we we not always, but sometimes committee members will come out of those office hours and report out to the entire committee. Mm -hmm something that they learned at the at the office mm -hmm. hour so i guess it's pretty loose in terms of the whole office hours thing in terms of what gets talked about you know it's right because it's really know, up to the person i mean it it's a freer it's much freer form for things that we're saying we can't talk about in public input here someone could come into the office hours and talk to us about it. i'm just i'm not saying right. i agree or disagree with it. I'm just putting it out mm -hmm. there that that's that that is an avenue where oh another avenue trouble. that that people uh, we start talking about uh, things that we're not supposed to talk about right right well we should te technically we should even in those office hours be sticking to the things in item seven in lot seven which is the things that were are within our authority in general and that's what people are coming to us on right um, but quite often, I mean, as we all do, we may get into conversations with people where we have to, we refer them to um, sort of the administration or, you know, what the process is to address something that's operational and not school committee. So I'll have to look at that. Dr. Doherty? I would just, I, I think it's probably in one of the uh, Section A policies. Not about necessarily office hours, but what the role of a school committee member yeah. is. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about and looking at. Um, yeah, and it may be something that we, uh, in planning um, for Dorothy to I, work with us, it may be a topic. I think topic. There, are, there are an extension of public comments, so they mm -hmm. should be addressed somewhere in this, in this policy, not necessarily school committee conduct, right? That's just... Mm -hmm. I think we can, I'm just really looking through this. I don't know that I, I don't know that I feel comfortable adding it to the policy because. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not saying that tonight. Yeah. But I think that it's something we should be, that we, we should look at it. Look into. Yeah. When we have that door. Yeah. Meeting, I guess. Yeah. Uh, are there any questions on the, um, Mr. Parks? One of the things we need to make sure we're looking at is number one says 15 minute public speaking we need to make sure our agenda is matching what our policy is going to be oh because it often says it has minutes. 10 Correct. allocated but if we're going to if we're going to indicate a hard number 15 we need to make sure the agenda reflects that 15 minutes so um in practice though um what we what we would uh, what we typically do is we start if there's no public input we definitely start the meeting I would say if somebody comes to the meeting within the first 15 minutes if we've started I know we've done this in the past where um, we would yeah. acknowledge them so um, I mean most most of the times I think that we we do um, most often though when people come in the middle of the meeting they're coming because they want to talk about an agenda item um, but I've never seen us you know not not do that, but to list the agenda time frame. Typically, we have seven to seven ten instead of seven fifteen. So it's a good point that it should really be should seven be to seven fifteen mm -hmm. to be consistent. Any other questions, Mr. Weiss? Sorry. Just a, I guess a point of clarification, or you know, whatever. Um, seven, essentially, the the change here, and in, in alignment with Natick is allowing parents to speak about their children in particular as it aligns to policy goals budget etc with regard to the school right i mean because yes. if we think about the last meeting miss bennett was told not to speak about her her child 
we think about some meetings last year, there were mm -hmm. parents told not to speak about their child, but that's essentially against the what it became the settlement agreement, but there was a preliminary injunction in that NADA case right. that led to the settlement agreement, right? Um, and the other, sort of, the other key change there is that the performance of the superintendent is also in game for that discussion, which historically has not been both positive and negative. Positive has been, but negative has not been, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's it's going to be a bit tricky for us to walk that line, I think, maybe. But that's the summative change of what seven is essentially allowing us right. to do that we historically were not open to in one way, shape, or form. Right, and I think that was we felt um, as we had always been just you know protecting student privacy and um, you know really trying to uphold that. And this really, as you said, would allow those comments as it pertains to right the the goals, educational goals, policy budget. Um, so it is going to be something that that's going to be different for us yeah, right. and you're right and we're going to have to make sure that we're appropriate with that so as a point of clarification or maybe maybe something to go back to Colby on I don't really know how to adjust this now or if we can and considering the issue that Natick had if a parent comes to speak about their child that's one thing if they come to speak about another child doing something to their child that's a separate thing altogether huh. and I think that this doesn't provide that clarity. I don't know if we can or not in alignment with that, um, but that seems to so be a question to me that this would, they say, hey, I can speak about children. It says I can speak about it as long as it aligns with these things. So that's yeah. um, something I would just think we need to be careful of. It, yeah, it, not to, I'm, I'm, if I'm trying to interpret what you're saying, if a parent is coming to talk about another child, that to me would fall under the purview that it's not under the school committee because it's not, a policy it's not because it's a it's a specific issue that's probably building based or something to that effect so I think it is covered here so because I would just kind of counter that real quick um, yeah I, I, I think the biggest question for that would be bullying yeah I was and bullying yeah. is a policy that is a policy that we theoretically have some purview over we not there's the operational side of it right there is the bullying policy that they can say, I'm here to speak on the bullying policy on behalf of my child who's being bullied by child X, mm -hmm. and nothing's being done about it, da, 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 right? I mean, right, that was so the there's, that's the, the line. It's a thin <clears throat> red line to a degree. I just think that there might be something we need to be, and Natick's policy is a little bit more clear in that regard. Um, I'm not sure there's a right answer here necessarily, right, right. but I just think it's something to be cognizant of and careful of. Mm -hmm. Right, but right. the actual, uh, just to continue in that line, an actual complaint about bullying is not under the purview of the school committee. That is actually under, operational. that's operational. So I think that's where it would, I mean, certainly if a parent is going to talk about it, it's tricky how you stop a parent. Right. But it, the response, there really can't be much of a response other than I think you need to, you're going to need to go back to the building. We'll certainly let that principal know. and. You know. Right. I mean, it, it's one thing if someone comes and they haven't filed the complaint. And right. I think we've heard, you know, there's been maybe cases like that where, okay, the process, the operational process hasn't been executed, and you can say, here, we really need you to sort of execute that process as well. But um, I, I, I think it, I think it could present it's present some challenges. Um, but we will. That we also sort of have some ideas about not only some time with Dorothy to have her come talk to us about some topics. Um, again, this could be one that she might be able to offer some, um, you know, just practical sort of in in, in execution of the policy. Um, we might. But, I mean, we might to that. Sorry. Yep. Um, to that point, we might want to put cross reference items in this policy. Mm -hmm. um, to the bullying policy and to other po policies that would be potentially inflammatory in a public comment type space. Um, and I could envision that there's a case where a parent feels like they did follow the process and it did not settle the way they wanted to settle. Right. And so this is the last method of, ex of escalation for them. Mm -hmm. So that would mean to me that we should be saying, well, that's a conversation we should be having an executive session with the right appropriation of everything else we need to have according to rule number one or rule number four or whatever it is in executive session but there I think there's something there from a line walking perspective we need to be careful of and well, then say refer to the bullying policy and 
maybe there's another conversation about changing that policy to add other escalation paths or if they there's come something to, there. Uh, office hours. But right. that brings back your question: Can you yeah, have that conversation gotta, in office hours? It's got to be addressed about office hours. Right. Um, so, are you saying that perhaps there are some of our policies that we should re that we should reference here, or? I, I think we probably should cross-reference some of the more potentially challenging policies. Um, and maybe that might mean that maybe we're not ready to do that now. Maybe that means after J July when we have the conversation with mm -hmm. Dorothy and others, if there's another update to one of those yeah. policies that we feel is necessary to align with this. And again, Natick was a very interesting case yeah. from a bullying perspective mm -hmm. and other things, right? Oh. That, and that led to big problems. Right. But and and the way that it that there was a number of opportunities to to Correct. maybe handle it in yep. different ways <laughs> so um i think we could we could certainly look at that and that's an i i'm sort of making notes of items to just sort of converse with dorothy about in terms of sort of planning that agenda and so it may be some sort of some you know the practical application of this and any guidance that she can provide for us about how you sort of walk that line, yep. don't get in a real sticky place, and sort of ma manage to keep it sort of respectful. Yep. So. Um, I could, um, to, to that point too, the other piece I could see getting muddy is bringing in talking about curriculum and how it's implemented and the mention of teachers who have protection by the union. So it's not our realm to talk about teachers, but they might come in with questions about a district improvement plan and examples of how it's not playing out in a certain way and go into specific references, which then are not okay because teachers would need to have their representation. Sorry, Dr. Doherty, sorry. So as long as they're talking about curriculum and instruction, that is in the purview of the school committee because it's, it's aligned with the district improvement plan. So. Right. If they. It's it, their right. It, it, now, if they start talking about individual teachers. That's what I was they say, saying. Then where that's where well. they right. would have to be redirected. That, right. That's, that's But again, I'm that's, that's where the chair would come in and. Right. And I think if you read the Natick case, that's probably where some of the pitfalls occurred, mm -hmm. shall we say. Ms. Browski. I don't, this is an idea to add to your list of things to discuss with council. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the, the, the discussion of, I think the discussion of other students is a concern and not just in the area of bullying. Child privacy. But um, yeah, I can see I can see a parent wanting to talk about social emotional initiatives and how they're playing out in a particular school. And for instance, I won't use names, but people know who the people know the situation. People know what it is. Yeah. So in 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 our attempt to protect First Amendment rights, which is a good thing, and protect ourselves there, I would hate to see us open up a vulnerability right. where a parent could, could come back and say my child was identified and several people knew who was being discussed. So I would just be interested, in, I don't have an answer to it, but it's a question I have and I'd like an answer to, how are we protected in this policy mm -hmm. where the chair can say, we're not gonna discuss students who are not your own child right. in any way, shape or form. Right. And I don't, I don't exactly know what the answer to that is, but it's a question, a concern I have. Yeah. Okay. We'll do some follow up with Colby. Um, Ms. Williams, did you wanna? Hi. Hi. policy that really affects parents and um, I've been in a lot of these meetings where parents have tried to say things that the school committee as a quorum needs to hear because telling one school committee member isn't going to do anything and telling two isn't going to do anything and sometimes telling three isn't going to do anything. So this is one of those things that being able to tell you all things that are happening that are within your pur purview, you know, bullying without identifying. Um, I just, I think this policy is really frustrating. and. One of the things that really frustrates me is that we can say anything positive about anybody, but the second we say anything negative, we're shut down. Um, and I know that's a, a point of frustration that this policy sort of needs to address. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I think right now we don't we don't have any changes to this first reading. I have um, some notes to really. Oh. Minor one. 
M Mr. Weiss, go ahead. Eight and nine, there's a space and there's no space in the other place. <laughs> Got that, John? <laughs> Consistent spacing. Yep. Um, but I think that uh, the items so that I have takeaways for us to sort of follow up with uh, Colby and or uh, Dorothy is sort of where are we on office hours? What kind of guidance? Where? How does? It, how does that sit with our policies? Um, and with regard to public input, um, specifically, you know, you ha could have some areas where, um, whether it's bullying or talking about teachers or getting into these places about where parents are bringing up, either discussing specifically other students or identifying other students, and what kind of guidance do we get? Can we get around that? So I think those are the sort of the follow-up items to try to to bring back. And we, I think, Tom. Also mentioned we should cross-reference some of those policies. policies. Yeah, and I think as part of that discussion, sort of fi fi yeah, find out what would that recommendation be. I think also to um, Ms. Williams' point that number eight sort of sort of starts to address that, but how do we how do we implement the a way to enable people to say positive and negative? Um, all speakers at number eight says all speakers are encouraged to present their remarks in a respectful manner. But sometimes we're not necessarily, people don't necessarily want to hear what's said, but people are coming to make sure we hear. So, right, that is, it is up to the chair to make sure that, that, that we do, that we do have the opportunity to hear people. I think the, um, you know, what was crossed out of that number seven was sort of, the judgment that you know improper conduct, defam uh, defamatory, abusive remarks, are always out of order, and that was removed. And I think part of that is that sometimes you know if someone, if an issue is really, um, it, as we all know, we're all parents here. Issues related to our children um, are sort of the most visceral for us, and so someone may come to a meeting and be very you know upset and and have a little difficulty controlling. Um, you know, just, you know, choosing the right words or tone or whatever. And we have to, I think what this policy is designed to do is to get us to basically try to keep, let the person speak, be focused, certainly try to keep things simmered down, but the reminder that we have an obligation, right, to, to listen to the concerns relative to um, our goals and objectives and policies and the things that we're responsible for. So I think that in that way, this is, I think this is trying to, to help us do that, this policy. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I think it's in, in practice, it's challenge, we know that it's challenging and, you know, we're gonna, we need to do a better job of it. And that's basically, certainly, the NATO case certainly shows that we need, committees need to do a better job of that. I think, I think, I, I think that compared to our, our committee, it's uh, um, quite an extreme, but we want to make sure that, you know, we're being, very cognizant and that we're always on the high road so i need a um, so technicality question yeah. um there seems to be a lot of questions potentially around this are we ready to do a first reading vote or do we think that because of the number of questions around this that we might need to table the first reading vote in order to allow for some of these follow-up questions to be answered and i don't know whether yeah. that this, you know, not doing the first reading vote risks certain things or not. I'm, I'm still learning some of the, those I, kind of things. So I'm just, want, I'm curious what the technicalities are. I, I don't think it would risk that. I think that the things that we're looking for are things that can um, be brought back, um, you know, to the next meeting. I think the key is if the, if that's not, if those aren't satisfied, then, we it, then we, the then we would put off the second vote. Then we would table it. So, okay. I think you know, moving forward with it allows sort of me to do this additional work, Dr. Darden and I, to have some conversation with Colby, collect the information, and be able to bring it back. And then we can always, if we needed to, delay the second vote. So, I'd like to um, have the motion and move forward with it. At least. Can I ask one point of clarification yeah. first? Do we have any worries about a teacher being called out for educational goals and not being here to represent himself? I know this is public comment, but 
we do have some. That would not be within the purview of the school committee. Because it's. Under educational goals. You're talking about an individual teacher, which is a personnel issue, which okay. is not under the purview of the school committee. It's only, the only person, personnel issue is the superintendent. Okay. So, right, which it includes, it, uh, so it states that. if someone came up to start talking about a teacher, you just have to say we can't talk about it. Right, we, I but think But it's saying to... involving staff member. Right. So any staff member other than you is going to be operational. Correct. Yes, it should be. And so, again, we would have to try to ask the, direct the person to talk more like about the, the issue. Is it curriculum? Is it, you know, is it, what is the issue without sort of talking about the teacher? Try to give us what information they can without talking about. I, I don't like this wording then because it says any comments involving staff members. Must concern. Yeah, right, educational, educational goals. goals, policies, or budget of the Reading Public Schools or the performance of the superintendent. But I can within talk about a teacher failing his goals. But it's within the school committee's authority. Okay. Okay, so the first is, is within the school committee's authority, and it's not within our authority. The superintendent's performance goals, district goals are within our authority, but individual teacher goals are not within our authority. So I think it might clarify if we were to change the wording in that, say, any comments um, must concern the educational goals and not Step. not be focused on at the end of saying that not be focused on individual staff members or students so I, I I would say must any comments involved concerning educate must be the district's education the district as well yes definitely agree with that. oh the district yeah, yeah, educational goals. I would agree with that definitely. yeah I must concern the district's educational goals. And again, I'll, um, this is a small change, but I mean, we, I'll definitely, we'll have a discussion with Colby and have her review that again. If we're adding this word, must concern the district's educational goals, we'll certainly have her be um, reviewing this again. Mr. Robinson. Guys, Dr. John. Uh, where Dr. John? Dr. John. Dr. John. <laughs> it's Ken. Mr. John. <laughs> where did you get this wording from? From Is that this came from legal counsel. Colby? Yeah. Yeah, as a result of my, my guess is it I, I believe it it's from the Natick policy. Or oh, hopefully not. It's refined. The, or no, the new, new, no, no, policy. The new policy. No, the new yeah. policy. Natick's is much longer than this now. Right. Right. The phrase though is I think from Yeah. Um one other point of clarification, I guess, since we just, and I think we all generally agree to district goals, and maybe Dr. Dory might be the best to answer this, but we also approve school council, school improvement goals. No, not anymore. None of the law. You don't. Just the district, the school council? Yeah, you, you do not approve school improvement plans. We used to. You used to, but the law changed. Okay. When did that change? You know? Oh, several years ago now. Okay. All right, thank you. Just wanted to clarify that. All right, Mrs. Stockser, can you read the motion right now? Yes. Um, move to accept the first reading of revised policy BEDH public participation. And with the modification that in number seven, um, the sentence, uh, any comments involving staff members or students must concern the districts. The word districts is added. Educational goals. Well, we took out involving staff members or students, right? I don't think we did. No. no. And I don't think that. Oh, I thought we took no. it out. I think no, that you we, did not. And again, this is, was the provided by legal counsel. So what I'd like to do, I, if we just make this one change and add the districts, I'd like her to verify that. I'm okay. I'm okay with that, but I, it, it still to me reads staff, and that worries me that it's going to come back to your policy says I can talk about staffs in, in regards to even a district educational. Can board. I ask the um, English teacher a question? Yeah. What if <laughs> this had on in a while? After school committee's authority, is there a different punctuation you could put, and then have any comments be lowercase, not another sentence that sort of that connects that in a different way? Because it does say, right, it should be limited to items that are within the school committee's authority. 
and then you have this sentence. It wouldn't change the meaning. Okay, so could it move you could that throw a clause? One in there, but I wouldn't. I think it that's wouldn't. The way it okay, is. but it does. But it does. It the, any the second sentence is sort of confined by the first sentence. Mm -hmm. or? Yes, because yes. it's all right. item number seven. Yeah, okay. yeah. I definitely so I, think it is. I think it's. Um, you know, it's we need. It's important that we understand that, yep. and that people understand that. Could. Could that um, involving staff members or students be moved to a sentence at, at the end so that the focus is on the district educational goals and then say, like, any discussion of involving staff members or students must be related to these district, you know, so it's separate. It it's does, not the first thing. But it, it does say does, that. It, it does. Can, it can just I make says, a suggestion? This, why don't we talk to legal counsel to see what this means before yes. we wordsmith it. So we, have, we, uh, we did add the districts. We'll put the districts in there, but we can follow up for the second reading to say, is there a better way of wording this without changing you know, in the substantive meaning? So. Okay, so the only change from the policy was adding the word districts. And, and, the, space I, and, the, yeah. and the space. And I have, a, uh, myself and Dr. Doherty have some homework. Second. Seconded by Mr. Robinson. All those in favor? And that's the vote. Excellent. Policy is like the sausage of lawyers. That's what they say, making sausage. This was always, so it's really good for us to actually make some progress. It takes a lot of time because you have a first and second reading and I think, you know, we're, we've got um, two more that will come up a little bit, um, well, in July, and then we'll, we'll, you know, try to sort of keep up with them at a particular pace. Um, I just want to make sure that people know our next meeting is June 20th, and... Six o'clock. Six o'clock start also, and um, actually... Sorry, our next meeting is Sunday for graduation. <laughs> We're not actually in session, no, but not we, a, it's not a meeting. <laughs> okay, our next time together as a team uh, is graduation, um, the b best day of the year probably, and then we meet on June 20th at 6 p.m., and then we also meet on the 27th at 6 p.m., um, and then we have July 11th and August 29th, and Dr. Darty and I are starting to work on calendar. There'll be that'll start to be in process. Yep. Did, um, does Principal Boynton know that we like to move along fat quickly? <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <No graduation. laughs> we do have a. Uh, there will be a number of people who will be coming up to take either my place or Dr. Doctor's place yes, and announce the Yes, it's going to be a an interesting logistical challenge, I think. So we typically we'll offer to the school, anyone who's served on the school committee, and uh, so that, that, that's that been extended. And then there are some teachers, Dr. Darty, in the district? Uh, staff members. Staff members. Yes, staff members. Staff right. members. And there was, there might be one other particular one. Yep. Yes, there's yep. one other, right, school committee members. So, all right, a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Mr. Mr. Parks, Ms. Borowski seconded. All those in favor? Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.